hit live on YouTube and then hit live on LinkedIn and then we should be good to go. Go live, all right. <clears throat> all right, five minutes, not too bad. Um, oh, can you just do a quick LinkedIn check? It always is like broadcast has ended even though it's actually not ended. No, I think we're good, yeah. Okay, it's looking good. This one's on. This one's on. All right, everyone. Welcome back from Reading Week. Um, thanks so much uh, for coming to today's class. We have another guest lecture, and then we have a little bit of an in-depth, uh, well, I'd say interactive lecture about cognitive walkthroughs after this. Uh, but we'll get started with a really nice um, guest lecture today from Jeremy Miller, who is actually one of my favorite podcast hosts. He uh, hosts the podcast Beyond UX Design, but he's also a UX design leader at GE Aerospace, uh, where he helped to shape the maintenance, repair, and overhaul of uh, the software strategy. He's got nearly two decades of experience in the industry, brings a wealth of experience to this role. And he champions the idea that soft skills make a truly effective UX professional. Central to Jeremy's approach is the conviction that you can build great software with, uh, you cannot build great software without great relationships. And I think he does that really, really well in the way that he teaches about UX. And he's going to share some in-depth stories about what it means to do UX in a company because he's been having that experience and talking about that experience with lots and lots of people. So as usual, feel free to ask your questions either on Teams or directly after the lecture. I'm very excited about this talk. All right, Jeremy, take it away. All right, awesome. Leonard, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to, to talk today. Um, I am, let's see, oh, I got to get back to my thing. There we go. Um, so I'm really excited to chat with everybody today. Um, I can't see the audience, so I don't, I don't know how many people I'm talking to. So uh, hopefully it's a full house. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but we're going to talk today about real life in the design trenches, narratives from the UX front lines. And after I wrote this, I was just like, man, this is a little like violent. It's a little, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe we, we shouldn't be talking in such uh, violent me uh, extremes here. But um, anyway, the, you know, the thing that to keep in mind and we're going to talk about today is that design in real life, in the UX world and software in general, is really nothing like what school, uh, school, but it's often very different from, from some of the things that, that you are taught, um, uh, generally speaking, uh, through, through your coursework and things like that. So we're going to talk about t that today. So a little bit about me, Jeremy, um, I, as Leonard just said, he actually just read a lot of this stuff, so I don't need to repeat it, but I've been doing software uh, years or so, but I've been doing design in general for almost two decades now. I uh, started off doing graphic design, web development, got into UX design that way, and um, that's, uh, that's pretty much me. Uh, so we're, let's see, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about unexpected road bumps, things that you probably aren't really expecting, uh, dealing with low maturity, uh, and not just UX maturity. I'm talking about maturity across the board, um, the idea that relationships are essential to our success as UX professionals, how to harness some of that influence, and then some that I've learned in the last 12 years or so. So we're going to do something that I actually haven't done before, uh, but I'm going to try this out. I'm narrative. <laughs> so um, this is my first time giving this specific talk in this way. So bear with me. This might, there might be, uh, it might be a little bit bumpy along the way. I'm probably going to uh, have a hard time speaking in the third person because I normally don't do that, but we're going to try uh, to do that. So we're going to go, we're going to jump back 12 years to 2011. This is young Jeremy. I want everybody to meet young Jeremy. Look how cute he is. 20 pounds lighter, no gray in his beard, no kids, no responsibilities. He has no idea how good He's actually got it. Um, I don't know how old anybody is out there. 2011, this is, you know, 12 years ago or so. Um, but the Arab Spring was in full swing. Um, Prince William just married Kate. That was a big deal. Um, unfortunately, later on, later this year, Steve Jobs is going to die. Um, and young Jeremy is a mid-20s designer. And he's, he's looking for his first UX gig. And Jeremy, the thing about Jeremy, he thinks he knows it all. This guy, he thinks he knows everything. Um, <laughs> he thinks he has all the answers. Uh, way too much about how great his work is, 
or how great he's work he thinks his work is i should say that um he thinks that designers know better than everybody else he talks over people and he never lets anybody get the last word and not always but generally speaking jeremy is a giant pain in the ass to work with so we're going to talk about jeremy and his uh transition to 20 pounds heavier uh gray hair and his beard today all right let's see all right so unexpected this is the thing that uh, a lot of people i think make this as when they graduate and they join a software team that um, everyone cares that they're the designers and the thing is most people um, don't generally care that they're designers i think not everybody hates designers obviously but uh, need to just respect his opinion because well he was the designer but the thing is, it took a little while for Jeremy to realize this, but everybody had their own ideas of what the right and wrong approach was when it came to building great software. The big thing that I think most people think is when they get there, they say, UX designer, I'm the UX designer, I should be involved with meetings, I should have my say, I should, you know, you should have, listen to me because I'm the designer. And nobody else really cares about that. And being the designer does not automatically grant you or anybody any kind of special privileges. And people won't just take you seriously or trust your your judgment or your opinion until you've actually proven that they can trust you. And that takes a lot of work. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Now, this doesn't have to necessarily mean providing business value. Like, you, prov you know, you prove that you could provide $10 million in revenue or blah, blah, blah. It just means that you can actually deliver and add some valuable insights to the team. And they can trust you and they can depend on you and you're going to get your work done on time. Took me a long time to figure that out, unfortunately. The other thing I want you to remember is that there is no process. You you hear a lot about, you know, the double diamond and diverge and converge and diverge and converge again. Um, I saw the triple double diamond the other day or the triple diamond. Um, you know, that kind of stuff, it, it might happen every once in a while. But generally speaking, Jeremy expected some standard process. But what he found was just this mixed bag of random standards or random steps that never really seemed to be repeated and there's there's usually just like like i said very little standard process across teams and you'll often hear a lot of this described as design maturity we're going to talk a little bit about maturity in a minute but every team has a different level of maturity it's not just designers um, the teams aren't always working as well-oiled machines as you might think even highly paid <laughs> professionals sometimes don't do what they're supposed to do um, and you'll often, you'll just get, you know, there's something else to rem remember is that often you'll, you'll get certain things won't be included, right? You'll, you won't get to do certain things. Um, it totally depends on the team. You might do research. You might not, you might do validation. You might not, you might get to talk to users. You might not. And that could change not only from team to team, but even project to project or feature to feature. It all depends on the team that you're on. And, uh, something else I ask, uh, UX designers this all the time. Uh, but back in the day, I used to think, uh, you know, solving problems was my thing. Jeremy always talked as if he was the only one who could solve problems. But what he quickly found was that everybody on the team was actually pretty damn good at solving problems. Um, and I do a lot of mentorship with, uh, you know, I used to do ADP lists and I do just random mentorship that I meet random people. And one of the things I ask a lot of people is, why did you become a UX designer? And Often, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this answer, I like solving problems. And then I say, okay, but why <laughs> UX design? Uh, because, you know, again, engineers, product managers, stakeholders, everybody on the team is also solving problems. Um, and so it's just something to remember. It's extremely patronizing <laughs> to assume that the UX designers are the only ones that are able to solve problems or bring unique ideas to the table. So don't hog the problem solving okay let let other people do it too all right now this is something that i actually didn't realize until even a couple of years ago when i took a training at work about this but uh, we're living in a vuca world and um jeremy learned uh relatively late <laughs> in life that building software is never as straightforward as you would think it would be and our jobs are full of this idea of vuca this volatile and certain complex in ambiguous situations. And this idea of VUCA is actually really interesting. We could probably talk for like an hour or more just about that. But it's this idea that was that was uh, that was uh, by the, the US War College, I think it was like in the 90s, after the Soviet 
And you might think, how on earth does this apply to software? Well, they came up with this idea of VUCA because they had all of these, you know, uh, random Soviet, ex-Soviet states with nukes and planes and bombs and everything else. And they're, how are we going to, how are we going to deal with all these people? They're all, or some are friendly, some are not. And they came up with this idea of VUCA. So in a volatile environment, the challenge is constant change. So things are just changing all the time. Right. So you could think about changes in technology, things like AI is this, you know, AI, AR, VR, all these things are happening all the time. So changes in technology, it could require our team to just change rapidly, pivot the approach um, and try to accommodate some of these new platforms. So so that's an example of how this could apply to software in an uncertain environment. The, the challenge is a lack of foresight. So uh, knowing what's going to happen, right? So we could be dealing with conflicting feedback from stakeholders or different ideas, different roadmaps, different budgets, different things like that. Um, and we might not know till the last minute. Um, and that could greatly uh, influence our product or the feature that we're working on. In a complex environment, the challenge is that it's just hard to digest it all. So if you think about software, we could be, you know, developing some product and it requires all kinds of integrations or third party platforms or systems and, and all these other things that require it to actually be a success. All these really intricate moving parts that we have to digest. This is something we see quite a bit in software. Um, and then lastly, ambiguous. This is sort of, the, you know, the challenge there is the la is a lack of understanding about different aspects of the problem. So it could, again, just be fuzzy goals, fuzzy objectives. We don't really know what we're doing. We don't really know why we're doing it. And this kind of thing, you would think that, you know, companies are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to develop software. Uh, you might be surprised how often all four of these things come up in our day-to-day -day, uh, work. So this is really important to remember. Um, so let's talk about dealing with low maturity. So you've probably heard, I'm sure, UX maturity. You've probably heard about Nielsen Norman Group's maturity scale, but maturity is not just a team have to think about. And Jeremy, young Jeremy, he realized that the maturity of that entire software team would greatly impact his work. Um, and the big thing that he, that took him some time to come to grasp with, <laughs> and I think accept, is that it was often way beyond his control and there was very little that, that young Jeremy could do to influence this, although there are some things that we'll talk about in a minute. So like I said, you probably heard of that UX maturity, but there's maturity. Every team that makes up the software team has some level of maturity. And what maturity really just, when we talk about maturity broadly, what we really mean is standard processes, standard ways that we operate, standard things that we do, standard ways that people work so that it isn't left up to chance. Anybody could come on the team and figure out exactly how to work with the rest of the team to get their jobs done. So when we think about maturity, the product team, maturity, the engineering team has a level of maturity. You know, you could think about agile maturity or CICD, you know, continuous delivery, continuous improvement delivery, uh, uh, maturity. Um, it could be low mature when it comes to how we support customers, low maturity for security or cloud or, you know, stakeholder maturity even, right? So low maturity can really, it can look different across many orgs. So when we say maturity, I don't want to give the impression that it's, it's a monolith. And that the hard thing there is that if we do have low maturity, how we interact with different people, different things, different problems could change greatly depending on how that's manifesting itself, right? So there's this, often there's this lack of process or standardization across teams, and it's, this is just a reality. So let's talk a little bit about product team maturity. Um, one thing that Jeremy realized was that the way that the product team operated, it would often dictate when and how Jeremy and his team was included. And again, he often had very little control over this. So when we think about low product team maturity, some ways that it might manifest itself that you'll probably see there's no objectives or goals. This is maybe the most common. I see this almost all the time. There's never any kind of metrics for success. There's never any kind of way for us to determine if we're actually building the right thing. There might not be a roadmap. There might not be some strategic vision that everybody's marching towards. Again, no metrics for success. There's, there could be lack of clarity around different roles and responsibilities. So you might see this manifest itself quite a bit with like the product team and the UX team butting heads, right? Who's gonna do discovery? Who's going to do research? Who's going to do validation? Who's going to do requirements gathering? Who's going to you know do something like write user stories? Who's going to approve mockups? Who's the final say in what gets built? 
um, there's often this lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities. You, you're probably going to see deadlines that are completely unrealistic. And, and most likely the people that are doing the actual work probably had no input <laughs> in the feasibility or the timeline. And you're going to see this quite a bit. Um, and when we talk about engineering maturity, um, you know, Jeremy, back in the day, um, the way that the, that team operated would often dictate how Jeremy's designs were executed in production. Um, and that success it, in, in these low maturity environments, what I often see is success depends on like a hero swooping in to save the day, right? And when you think about low maturity, that's because someone had to stay late. <laughs> someone had to work nights or weekends to push something to production um, when in reality, a, a low, a, a high a maturity engineering team, there shouldn't be any heroes because everybody knows how to work well together, right? So those low maturity teams, you know, engineering teams go over budget, the schedules, the timelines might be all over the place. They're probably missing deadlines. Engineers might ignore the UX team completely. They might never look at a mock-up. They might just build whatever they want based on a user story. Um, the quality might be low. There might be, you know, bugs. Um, but even then, low maturity doesn't always mean low quality. It just means that no one's really doing the same thing. So the way one engineering team operates, they might be doing sprints one way. Another one might be doing sprints another way. One might be, you know, having different cadences. The other one might not. It might be very hard for you as a UX designer to show up to those meetings because they're just all over the place. Um, and, and a lot of times with low maturity, what happens is stuff that ends up in production might not look like anything that you designed, which is something you probably hear quite a bit from, from UX designers. Um, when we talk about stakeholder maturity, the way that those stakeholders would deal with that entire software team, not just UX team, it would often di dictate how much say Jeremy and his team would have. Right? So when you think about low maturity for stakeholders, this isn't to say that, that the stakeholders don't necessarily know what they're doing. Because often stakeholders, it's not their job to be you know, software people, right? They're the subject matter experts. But it's, it's the low maturity in how the software team handles the stakeholders, how the software team sets the expectation on what the stakeholders will or will not control. So when you have that low maturity, what you find a lot is interference from the stakeholders. Right? They're going to come in, they're going to push the team to, to do whatever they want. They might have some political agenda. They might want to get some quick fix, you know, ignoring some kind of long-term uh, stability or whatever. Um, they might try to throw their weight around you know, as, the, as either the subject matter expert, maybe they're an executive. You know, whatever their role happens to be, they're going to try to throw their weight around. They might push for unrealistic deadlines. Um, and then, you know, again, they might have some political agenda. And I think often when you hear about politics in large orgs, this is sort of partly the reason is that low maturity because there isn't a clear way. And again, clear expectations and processes around how we deal with different stakeholders that are should be, in, in theory, influencing the teams in certain ways. So when we talk about design maturity, this is one that you probably hear more often than any of the others, but you know, this is the way that entire company, the way they perceive that design function, largely influenced Jeremy's roles and responsibilities and what Jeremy did, when he did it, how he did it, how much money he had to do those things, right? Research trips and things like that wouldn't get funding. All of that was because the, the org itself had low design maturity. So again, you know, we're skipping steps, we're rushing steps, we're not, we're not thinking about research. We're not thinking about planning. We're not thinking about resources, having the right amount of UX designers to do that job. You might have a champion. You know, again, doesn't mean nobody at the team, uh, nobody on the team cares about UX, but you might have one champion, but it's just not widely supported, right? UX is probably an afterthought. Um, and when you think about this design maturity scale, I think there's, there, to be clear, there's a lot of design maturity scales. Nielsen Norman Group is probably one of the most popular. Um, but the reason why I like talking about the Nielsen Norman group is every year, well, not every year, they haven't done it in a couple of years now, but they, they're one of the few that would do a survey. And as of January, I think January, 2022, um, they did uh, a survey and it was, you know, a scale from one to six, um, one being the lowest, six being the highest. And the third stage was emergent, got about 49%. The fourth stage structured got about 28%. And the sixth stage, the highest stage, got 0.04%. So not even half of one percentage point were at that highest level. So I think the biggest thing to, to remember here is that when we think about this, like about 80%, I'm not good at math, 48, 49 plus 28, 
about 80% of orgs, people at least who responded to this, were right in the middle. And so what that means is that you're most likely going to end up, probably, you have a pretty high percentage chance to end up at one of these middling maturity companies. Probably won't be super low, probably won't be super high. Um, and that's just something to think about. Now, the thing that I want to make sure everybody understands, though, is that when I say low maturity, I don't mean bad. It just, it's different ways to work. So the thing that Jeremy realized over time was that that low maturity kind of a death sentence. It didn't mean the end of his career, right? Jeremy still found lots of opportunities to try to work with his team to deliver really great work, right? And so some ways that you can do this, you know, set expectations up front with your, with your core team. Now, again, you remember you, you talk about not having a lot of say. That doesn't mean we have no say. It means we don't have the ability to, or, to dictate top down, but we can certainly work with our team and the people around us, our core team, to change how we work. And I like those people are probably not malicious. They're probably not, you know, coming to work thinking, how do I screw over the UX team today? It's just that we're an afterthought. So if we can work with the team, try to set those expectations up front, figure out what our roles and responsibilities are, um, try to build M try to, you know, choose your battles and be flexible, establish some metrics up front if you can, measurable goals. It's something you can actually control. You know, you can make your work visible. You can share your work. You don't need to work in a silo. You don't need to go off in a corner and design something, come back two weeks later when you're done. You could do it in public. You could do it with your team. You can include your team on research, other activities to help them build that UX muscle. And then lastly, you know, be patient <laughs> because this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. It's going to, you know, think about the long game. Um, and then over time, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to build really strong relationships, which is what we're going to talk about next. So building relationships. Why is this so important? Let me tell you. So building relationships, it's important mostly because we cannot do this work alone. Um, and it took Jeremy some time for him to understand that building great software is not possible. I think it is not possible, absolutely impossible, without building great relationships first. When you think about software, there's so many moving parts, right? There's like not just developed front end, back end, QA teams, there's cloud architects, there's security teams, there's product teams, there's marketing teams, there's you know support teams, there's sales teams. It's, it's impossible to do this work alone. So there are so many moving parts that you have got to work with these other people if you want any of it to deliver value for your users, right? And I used to use this, I used to say this thing where software was easy, the people are hard, and I got a lot of pushback from my, uh, my engineering friends. So now I say, right, you can, you can type in the code and assuming you figured out, you know, the right code and the right strings and everything to type and assume you don't have any typos, you're not going to get any bugs. You're going to get exactly what you typed. You know, that's pretty straightforward. It might not be easy, but it's straightforward. What makes software really hard people, right? And that's why it's really important because we're going to have really difficult conversations at some point in our career. And what's critical is to realize that the great relationships make those hard conversations easier. And that's something I think everybody needs to understand. So, how do you do that? Well, first, you got to get to know your team. You know, so back in the day, Jeremy, young Jeremy, young cute in the meetings, he skipped the small talk. He would jump straight into whatever the topic was. And when he did that, he missed all those opportunities to lay foundations for those great relationships with his team. Right. And like I said, you're going to have a lot of really hard conversations. Better to have hard conversations with people you like and people that trust you. Then an other, right? An enemy that you don't actually like. Um, so breaking, breaking down the silos, build cross-functional relationships with people beyond just the UX team. I'm talking, you know, any kind of stakeholders, um, any kind of uh, engineers, lead engineers, whoever you would work with on a daily basis. These are the people that you really need to get to know. So like I said, don't skip the small talk. In a meeting, oh, how was your weekend? Oh, good. Oh, I heard your kids are sick. Are they doing better? Oh, great. You know, that kind of stuff, it builds trust and that's the foundation for really great relationships. Another great idea is if you're if you're remote or if you work with people in other countries or something, learn some of the language, like just hello, thanks, bye. 
these are, are things that I think are just, they, they mean a lot to people. I used to work with people in, in Hungary and Poland. I still have my books up there because I, I try to you know remember to practice. And just the fact that they, I would say hello or thank you or goodbye or something, like in, in, in a relatively hard language to learn, like Hungarian or Polish, a long way in building, really important. Um, regular one on We're not having one-on-ones with people other than your boss who are doing it wrong. Um, regular meetings could be once every month. I like to do once every three weeks because it's not quite every two weeks. It feels a little long, but it's not so long that it's a month and, and things happen because in software, things do tend to move relatively quickly sometimes. Um, but it really helps to build that empathy for your What pressures are they under, right? We talk a lot as UX designers. Uh, for users, but what we don't often do is talk about empathy for the people in our team and understanding the pressures they're under. We always just as quick to assume, oh, the stupid stakeholder, oh, the stupid product manager, they're, they're idiots, you know. But there's 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 something going on there, and, and if we don't do those one-on-ones, it's a lot harder to figure that out. The other valuable thing about one-on-ones, it's a great opportunity to disagree in private. The last thing that you want to do if you're trying to build a relationship with is call someone out in a group setting, maybe their boss is in there, maybe their, maybe their direct reports are in there, and calling them out, they get really, so if you do that in a way, it's a lot easier to disagree, you also get to divide and conquer that way too, which is something else that, that I think is, is also a huge benefit of one-on-ones. So get, so get to know your team. Flexibility over rigidity. Jeremy, back in the day, I'd say he was a, he was a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> he was principled, and he was stubborn. And nearly every single conversation that Jeremy had would end up in some kind of an argument. And that only ended up being a roadblock, right? And so when he would do that and he would argue with people and put his foot down and refuse to flex and refuse to, to change his mind, things didn't get done. And when things getting, didn't get done, guess what? It hurt, it hurt those relationships and it, it ruined that trust. So being principled is fine. I don't want to say don't be principled and I don't want to say be an order taker. But when we get so inflexible that we become the reason the team slows down, that's a huge problem. Um, I, I uh, interviewed somebody on my show a couple of months back, Dr. David Leitner, about this concept of followership. And one of the things that he brought up is it's critical, and this is something I think a lot of people don't think about because they think of it as just bending over, but it's really important if you're a team player to disagree but commit. Right, you don't have to take it. You don't. You can speak up. You can be courageous in how you you argue or how you disagree. But at the end of the day, the team is 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 depending on you to commit. So you know, we we've got to understand that like being regimented and having those ideals, it will not get your designs to production. Sometimes at a certain point, you have to say, okay, I'm not going to win. That's all right. You know, I'll I'll pick the next battle and I'll fight another day. Um, so anyway, that certainly, I think over time you build a certain reputation for either being difficult to work with or being very easy to work with. Um, and you know, I've actually had, I've different people, UX team, engineers, whatever. I dreaded meetings. I hated meetings with them, with these, some of these people, because I knew it was going to be right. And you just, you don't want to be that person. I promise you do not want to be that person. All right. Internal networking. So when working often i think people think to get a job and when they get the job they never they don't continue networking. i think that is a huge miss from a lot of people and wait for people to point them in the right direction tell them what to do but over time what he learned was that there are people in the company that had those answers and it was up to him to find them so people are not going to always tell you what to do who to talk to how to figure it out, where to go, that's partly your job, right? Now, chances are good, all these people in your team, they've got little clues, right? You're like a detective. You're going around, you're hunting for all the clues, or you're like a treasure hunter. You're, you're looking for the treasure. Um, this is, it's, it's so important to meet all these people in your team, people that are not, that you don't necessarily work with every day. You know, if you work with a team that integrates with some other application inside the company, you know, go and network with that person, find them and just, you know, you don't have to need anything from them today, but just having a 20, 30 minute conversation, let them know how they might be able to help you and how you might be able to help them and make their job easier too in the future. Be, you know, having these connections well before you need them, so well. 
The other thing that a lot of people I don't think realize, and this might not be true at a small startup, but a large organization, a big corporation or something, there's internal roles that they'll post that are only available for internal uh, internal uh, employees. And if you're not doing that internal networking, you might never find those those roles. So I think this is something that's like really important. You know, keep those network, keep that networking going. You know, just could be a little coffee chat once every few months or something like that. Doesn't need to be as often as those one on ones, but internal networking is going to make your job a lot easier. I promise. So last thing that I want to talk about here is this idea of political and social capital, and you know, over time, what Jeremy learned is that it's so important to build up this capital. And this is how you help influence and advance your career, influence your team and advance your career over time. So political and social capital, and political sounds weird, um, but it's this idea, it's like a pool, right? Think of it as like a bank account. It's your, your, the money that you can spend or the, the, the currency that you can spend to influence or disagree, right? And if you just did nothing but disagree all day, you're going to spend all the, all, the, all the social and political capital, and you're not going to be bringing any in to replenish the, the bank account. Um, so, you know, to disagree without being completely dismissed as the, the oh, we, we don't want to talk to him. He's always disagreeing. Um, it's how you change people's mind. It's how you influence without any direct authority, right? And often as UX professionals, we do not have any direct authority. And this is how we influence our team. So without it, it's super hard to do that. Um, you think about everybody having their own kind of transaction costs, right? When you have to have those hard conversations, it might cost you some. And when you have some good conversations, it might gain you some when you deliver when on time and things like that, right? So you have to know how to accumulate that that account so that you're you're never going bankrupt. That's the last thing you want to do is is have your political and social capital go bankrupt. So understand how all of those actions every day will either act as a debit or a credit to that account. Okay. That's something really important. Um, and without that, you can't influence. So Influence. This is so important. Harnessing influence is, I think, you know, one of the most important things that we can do as UX professionals. Um, now, influence is often seen as a dirty word, um, and Jeremy was always apprehensive of using that term influence because he didn't want to seem like he was manipulating people. But I think our job as UX professionals is to understand all those big problems and it benefits the users, bring that insight, and then influence the rest of the team to, to, to want to build that software to help those users when it's probably not about it, right? Our job is to think about users, engineers, and the others. That's not their job. Product managers should be their job. But often it's not. So agree, and they have their own ideas. If we, if we want to be anything but just pixel pushers, we have to figure out how to influence the team. And this is so important. Now, one of the ways that we do that, I think, is with storytelling. And this is my personal opinion, <laughs> but I think storytelling is a hard skill. This is something we should absolutely 100% be trying to master if you want to make any kind of meaningful change for users. And back in the day, young Jeremy, young, cute, naive Jeremy used to think that his designs would just speak for themselves and the team would just look at the designs and think, oh my God, these are amazing. I get it. Well, it turns out, they never, ever do. And it's your job as a UX professional to sell those things. All the things that you want to do, whether that's research, whether that's features, whether whatever it is, storytelling is, the I think, one of the single best ways to influence your team, right? It's talking about the what and not the... It's talking about the why and not the what. Sorry, I got that backwards. <laughs> um, and so, you know, think about things like metaphors, analogies, coming up with characters to root for, the way you describe it. You know, again, talking about the importance of a feature versus we will put this component here and the border radius is just nobody cares about that stuff. What they care is about the impact, right? And that's how we do that with storytelling. Um, the power of communication. This is so important. Um, over time, Jeremy came to understand the value of clear communication, and he put a lot of effort into being very clear and concise when he would deliver his messages, whether that was through a meeting or an email or a direct message. Or, uh, uh, communicating those ideas and those things is absolutely critical. Um, and we have to articulate those decisions so that people understand all of the why behind it. So this goes hand in hand with storytelling, right? But it's about knowing when to listen. It's about knowing when to speak. It's about knowing when to be brief. And it's about knowing when to expand on something, right? 
And it's about knowing how our team likes to communicate so that we can most effectively communicate with them. And the only way that we can do that is, again, tying us all back to relationships. We have to know how different people want to communicate most effectively with them. And I think this quote right here is my all-time favorite quote of all time. Um, I think this is the best quote ever, um, mostly because I think it, it, it tells, it, it, it talks, it speaks to me about our job as UX professionals. This guy, Anton, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, was a French author in the 40s. He wrote a book called The Little Prince you may or may not have heard of. Um, but he asked this question, how do you build a ship, right? And if you want to build a ship, you don't, you don't drum up the people, you don't divide the work, you don't bark out. If you want to build a ship, you gather the people and you teach them to long for the vast and endless. Long for the vast and endless. You will never have a problem getting that ship built, I promise. And the same goes for software. Hire our team and want to build the best possible software that they can. We'll never have to fight them. You know, it might not be exactly what we had in mind, but it's amazing software because the team cares. And I think that's really important. Lessons learned here, tying it up. Um, what do we really know <laughs> as UX designers? I think it took me, Jeremy, it took young Jeremy a very long time to realize that he didn't know nearly as much as he thought. And I think any UX designer that thinks that they have it all figured out probably doesn't have it figured out. Um, so don't assume you, um, if you should never be the smartest person in the room. You shouldn't think you're the smartest person in the room. If you're, if you're the smartest person in the room, find another room. Um, you, you don't know nearly as much as you think, I promise you. Um, just always ready to be wrong. Always be ready to be wrong. Um, learn from your mistakes. You know, that growth mindset is, is so important for UX designer. And remember that failure is not necessarily a bad thing. Every failure can teach us how to not fail next time, as long as we're, we're learning something from it, right? So uh, we don't really know everything. I think that's really important. Um, one thing that I have embraced over time is this idea of Socratic ignorance. Um, and this is not uh, a direct Socrates quote. Um, I expanded on a little bit, but um, Socrates, this idea of uh, Socratic ignorance basically says, all I know for certain is that I know nothing for certain. And I think this is something UX professionals, really anybody, can probably learn a, two, a thing or two by embracing this mindset. I think this idea of Socratic ignorance is so important. Um, and because of that, just remember that your learning journey is not over. and It's probably never going to be over. And when Jeremy started his career, he would assume he knew everything and he'd talk your ear off about how great his stuff was and all that. Um, he, knew, he knew everything there was to know. Uh, boy, was he wrong. <laughs> Young Jeremy didn't know a goddamn thing. I can promise you that. So don't assume that once you get your diploma, learn from books, learn from peers, learn from people on your team that you don't usually work with, learn from people on your team you do usually work with. Keep reading. I think audiobooks count too. Uh, keep listening to podcasts. I know of a few good ones. Um, learn from people on places like LinkedIn or social media, although you know you may have to vet your sources there just to make sure that they're legit. But, you know, go to meetings, go to meetups, go to conferences, talks, attend stuff like this long after you graduate. Um, I can promise you that you were never, ever, ever done learning. Um, and then again, remember, people make our job hard. Like, it's not the code that makes our job hard. And back in the day, young, naive Jeremy, he thought the hardest part was solving problems and, and brainstorming and, and ideating and all that stuff. And while that's still not necessarily easy, the hardest part is navigating all the different personalities and conflicting opinions. Um, and so, again, we talked about this a little bit, but you've got to be able to build those great relationships um, or you're not going to get anything done and push to production. And then lastly, if you can't work with your team to get that stuff shipped to production to actually help a user out and make their day better, what on earth was the point? Why bother doing it at all? And back in the day, Jeremy would focus just so much on designing that most amazing feature that he could. But... If he couldn't work with his team to get it built because he was a giant pain in the ass to work with, what was the point of doing it at all, right? Um, if we can't work with, with our team to get those amazing features that we know, we just know are going to benefit users um, there, then, you know, if they can't get it in their hands and start doing the thing because we were a pain in the ass to work with, then it was, it was all for nothing. And it wasn't worth 
are doing and you know we got a paycheck hopefully but it wasn't worth doing and there wasn't a point i think so don't be stubborn don't be so inflexible that people can't work with you don't lose though but understand that you know some battles are worth fighting and some are not know when to pick your battles and know when to just say all right i'll t- i'll get it next time i'll win the next one i think that's really important all right and that is actually it y'all that's it i hope that was uh that was helpful i've got some resources back here i'll share this deck with uh leonard and i've got some links and things like that that out Uh, but that is it so we've got i think another like 25 minutes for for questions so let's open it up well thank you jeremy let's give him a hand that's a lot of people uh (laughs) that was uh that was an awesome talk um so i'll Pass on questions to the audience first. I know there's a lot of questions online uh, that I'm happy to relay, but let's get started with everyone that's here. So do you have any particular questions from anyone that's here, or if you're a little shy about it, also feel free to just post it in Teams instead. Does anyone want to raise their hand? Everyone seems a little tired on a Monday morning after reading week. Um, anyone? I did a really good job. Okay, so we'll, we'll start with the online questions, give these folks a little bit to uh, wake up. Um, so the first one that I have here is from uh, Reza, who's saying, this was a great talk. Um, I have a few questions. Um, how can we align stakeholder expectations from to UX? Let's start with that one. He's got more, but let's, let's start with that one. Okay, uh, align, well, I would say, just remember UI and UX are sort of separate. So UX is is obviously the experience that a user has, and the UI is the avenue which by which they interact with the thing to have that experience or not. Um, so how do we align with stakeholders? I actually, um, I think this is really important, again, the, the one-on-ones. Um, if you're working with a stakeholder on a regular basis, I cannot stress enough the importance of one-on-ones. Um, this is a way for you to understand their perspective, understand where they're coming from, what problem, what constraints they're under. You know, for instance, if a stakeholder comes to you and says, "I need you to do this thing by tomorrow," you got to do it, and you don't. You know, you have no idea why. You might say, "Oh, you know, that guy's an idiot. I don't know why he's asking me to do this." And then you start talking to me, you realize, like, "Oh wait, um, there's this really important thing. The the company is going to lose a billion dollars if we don't get this thing done by tomorrow." So, you know, in that case, those one-on-ones they add a lot of context. Again, it has that idea of empathy and understanding like where they're coming from, their perspective, their needs, their wants, their like their pain points and all that stuff. And then you can work with them to be that team player to build trust so that you can also say over time, hey, um, you know, next time if we did this, I think that outcome and here's this thing I think we can track. And, you know, you start to build that relationship and that friendly relationship with them. And then you'll get to the point where, again, over time, it's not going to, you'll get to the point where actually changing processes. Assuming positive intent, assuming they're not like just malicious jerks <laughs> and they're trying to railroad everything. Um, if that happens, you know, that's certainly a totally different conversation to have. But I think the one-on-ones, that's the best place. That's the way I would start. Um, and I would say, you know, try to deliver at first if you if you ha- are having a hard time with them. I'm not saying bend over. I'm not saying roll over and do whatever they say forever. But it, it might not be a bad idea to, you know, deliver that one thing for them and start to explain how maybe next time I've got a better way to do it. I'll come next time. Awesome. I'm. I have camera issues, so I'm going to need to refresh in a second. But I'm going to ask you the next question first, and then I'm going to refresh this, and you should see me again. Um, how can we ensure UX is considered from the project start and not just an afterthought? Yeah. Well, again, I think this goes back to those that whole relationship piece. So, when when you think about that, and you think about the whole process, right? we're talking about maturity here and we're thinking, okay, um, if I'm not included, there's some standard processes that aren't working. Who can I influence to change that process? And that's when you start to think about like who is in charge of what, who has control over what, who influences who, and how can I network and figure out where I need to go and talk to whoever I need to talk to, to find allies that can help the influence because as a lowly UX designer, I probably don't have a lot of influence to bet there are people in your team that have higher level of influence that agree with you it's just a matter of finding them 
right? It could be an executive, could be a VP, could be a director. What you can't do is go alone and try to do it all yourself. You gotta find allies, which again is why these one-on-ones are really important because you'll find the allies that way pretty quickly. Um, I did a deep dive actually on low maturity um, a month or two ago, and I, I, I uh, had a whole episode about stakeholder maturity. And in that episode, I, I had a couple of tools that you can use. So there's a stakeholder assessment map where you can kind of track different people and who influences who and where they are and where you need to get them. It kind of helps you create a strategy to help influence or help figure out who you need to target at least to influence them so that you can get whatever outcome you want. So I think that's the biggest, again, I know I've said this a bunch, but like the relationship, like everything kind of, to me, this is where I say like, you can't build great software without great relationships because it all kind of goes back to that, I think. So, you know, it's all what you're doing in those relationships is maybe how they change. But uh, find the allies, find people who can help you because the chances of you doing it as a lowly individual contributor are probably low. So find those people who can influence from the top. Okay, yeah, I, I really like that emphasis on, on people and relationships because uh, that's really at the heart of a lot of what we do. Um, so next question, I'm gonna maybe, no, I'm gonna do them separately. So you had four questions, this is the third one of them. Um, what are effective strategies to communicate UX results to stakeholders? Uh, what are your suggestions? What are the yeah, best or most cool. effective strategies? Yeah, Yeah, for sure. All right, so I, I think the, the biggest thing is thinking about that idea of storytelling. Um, I think for one, having a, a clear story and starting with the outcome. Like, why are you doing it? It isn't, you know, we added a feature, we did 100 things, we did 100 usability studies, I talked to 200 users. And synthesize it down to the why. Like, what is the outcome that you wanna achieve here? And that's where that presentation starts. Um, I can't recommend Jeff White's storytelling course enough. If you aren't familiar with Jeff White, He's on LinkedIn, he posts all the time about this, but he's got a course and a book. The book is free, I think the course is like 50 bucks or 60, it's not expensive. But he does a really great job of explaining how to use storytelling to influence the team, but specifically around UX design. So when you think about storytelling, the problem I've, I've run into when I say that is, people think once upon a time there was a thing and blah, 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 the storytelling thing, right? But, but storytelling is way more than that. It's like using metaphors and easy ways to convey messages and things like that. So I think for me, that idea of one, one thing Jeff always says is write an outline first. Don't start designing a deck, right? Don't get into Figma, start designing stuff. Just write it down on a piece of paper, pen and paper. You don't even need a computer. And just what is it I'm trying to do? What is the outcome? Who am I talking to? What do they care about? And how do you craft that message to influence them and the things they care about, right? You have to know your audience, obviously. Relationships and one-on-ones, hopefully, you're having those and you know who your audience is, unless it's like, you're, I don't know, you're CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation and you have no chance. But even then, there's probably people that do know. So you can always go and find those people. Um, so I think, did I answer a question, Leonard? I think that was it, right? How do you how do you start? Yeah, so yeah I think, no, I love I that framing, the emphasis on story and, and obviously Jeff's course uh, is, is a really great uh, example of that. Um, he, he's also asking, and, and then I'm going to move on to the next one, um, but he's also asking how can we handle disagreements within a small unsupervised UX team, now talking about the whole UX maturity thing that you sp spoke to, and what does uh, empathy signify in all of this, right? Like when we are yeah. on, a, on a very small team and we're, we're struggling with getting everyone on the same page. Yeah, I think, well, again, the one-on-ones, really, the I mean, this is a really good opportunity Go for a walk. Don't you don't have to call it one on ones because one on ones sounds so formal. Like go for a walk. Go get coffee. You know, or just like hang out and and if it's remote, just like a quick phone call. Try to do it when you're looking at each other, um, as opposed to just typing emails because so much of that emotion is either lost or inferred when you're doing it digitally. And you're you're reading a thing. You don't know what the tone is. The body language is gone. And you know. What are those conflicts? Like, why are you having so many conflicts? What is the root of the conflict? Why do they think a certain way? And again, having those relationships and the empathy and, and thinking about that empathy, it's not just like a buzzword. It's, it's just understanding where they're coming from. Like, why do they think that way? What's their reasoning behind it? And you might find that you were wrong. You might find that, you know what I, what I care about isn't as important as this. They got a good point. Maybe that thing is really important. So I think if you're gonna, if you're in these small groups, especially unstructured and there isn't like a, a leader top down kind of thing. You know, I hate to say that I've used a lot of like kind of like war analogies, but divide and conquer, right? Like 
have little separate one-on-ones and get everyone's perspective and then just reflect and go back and like just think for like, I don't know, take an hour, go for a walk yourself, take a shower or whatever. And just think like, what is going on here? Why are people listening? Are we really that far apart? Or are we just saying it a different way? You know, it could be like anything. So it's hard to like go down a specific route. But I think if in these situations, again, the one-on-one conversations, having those talks, hopefully over video chat or something where you can actually see their, their tone and their body language, get to understand their perspective and then regroup and then just think about like, is this really that important? Is it worth fighting over or can we just move forward? Because at the end of the day, with software, the goal is to move forward. You know, like it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. If I don't get that thing pushed to production this sprint or this quarter, maybe I can do it next quarter. Maybe I can do it next year, you know? Like it hurts to say I'm not gonna have it for two years. What matters is someone's getting that stuff shipped. So think about that. I think that's the biggest thing. Like what can we do to move forward? Can we compromise? You know, and again, it's not about like just bending over every time and and you know rolling over and taking whatever and not and put and not getting any pushback. But um, I, I really do think like there's an opportunity for us to collaborate. At the end of the day, is it really worth fighting over? I mean, that's like a big thing I ask myself a lot. I'm just like, you know, I get paid every other Friday. Is this really that big of a deal? You know. So I think that's something to think about as well. Like, you know, what what why are we so hung up? on not changing our mind. I think that's maybe like looking back and reflecting on us. Like, what is it about this that's not letting me change my mind? I think that's something also to think about. Yeah, for sure. And I think sometimes it's also uh, a vocabulary issue, right? Like that, it's just mm. like, it's a, it's a translation issue. And that's yeah. so much easier to do when you go on a walk with somebody. Like if this actually happens in my research group with my grad students as well. The best communication and, and problem solving occurs when we're both walking and um yeah just the the way that the brain gets um extra energy and, and extra um absolutely think and i think stuff. like post post covid like not having those physical interactions i mean not going to the office is great working from home is great i'm not saying i want to go back to the office by any means but i think that's a huge thing that we're losing is that physical interaction because there's so much communication that happens through body language that we just completely miss when we're 100 percent remote and you may you brought up a good point. I don't know if this is the problem, but like we are remote a lot of times. And sometimes we're not only just like in the different house or a different building across the city, we might be in different cities, we might be in different countries. So there's culture norms there that often we might misinterpret. So, you know, I work with a lot of people in India, in Europe, in Asia and things like that, and the way that they communicate is is different. I mean, good or bad, but it's different, right? Um, actually GE is funny. Uh, like they don't, I don't know if they still do this. I think they did. They, they would do um, courses that different nationalities could take if they were working with other nationalities. So like we work with people in Hungary and um, this is so funny. All of a sudden, everybody started thanking us, everybody on the team in the US. And they're like, oh, thank you, thank you. And we're like, it's weird, they're thanking us. I don't know what We found out that they took a course that said Americans like to be acknowledged for doing something. So everybody was like thanking us. It was just like so funny that they, you know, they had that, anyway, this is like a funny anecdote. But um, there's cultural norms there too that could also be misinterpreted that may not always be, I don't know what the right word is, may not always be, you know, something there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. This is from Hang, so prepare to be uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> to be a little bit more intense. Yeah. He says, young Jeremy was in debt, indeed a cutie. Uh, question, how does one decide when it is time to move on from an environment due to the design immaturity versus doing your best to improve it? So when yeah, do you call well, it I, quits? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, I mean, Hang, yeah, Hang and I have talked about this too, for sure. But um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a personal question. It's like, what can you actually do? Can you influence change? But a lot of times too, it's, there's a question of, can I actually afford to quit? Um, and then there's the, there's the personal question. What's the balance there? Like I, I can't afford to quit, but I'm killing my mental, like, I don't want to say that term. I'm like ruining my mental health, you know? And so there's a balance. It's like, what is the personal, um, what is, what is personally acceptable to you? Right? If I don't have kids and I have no responsibilities and I'm young, single mid twenties, I might be able to quit and go get a job waiting tables and still support myself. If I've got two kids, a wife, a mortgage, you know, a car note and stuff, it's probably less likely that I actually can quit. And so depending on the situation that you're in and the privilege that you have, whether or not you're financially able to quit is one question. The other question is, am I making a difference? 
you know, and I think there's certainly uh, the conversation should be had. I personally like to assume positive intent and try to change some things. But if I'm getting to the point where I'm constantly being, you know, being told no, constantly not allowed to do the things I, I think are right, you know, you, you can certainly talk to yourself there and say like, well, am I actually, is my career benefiting? Because often in these low maturity orgs, you know, this is something that like, I, I don't think a lot of people necessarily talk about. Hung, I know Hans talk about this, but like if, if I'm not working with a high maturity team, what does my work look like and how valuable am I to the next company? You know, if I go to a company that has very high maturity and I've spent three or four years at a company with very low maturity, my work is probably suffering. My portfolio probably isn't as good. I'm probably not as experienced as I could be if I were working with a more high performing team. So, you know, there's something to think about there. Am I actually hurting myself staying there? You know, and so I think there's opportunity to improve, obviously, but I think there's also a, a potential for you to probably say this probably isn't worth it. Right now is a really hard time to find a job, so I would probably say find a job before you quit, <laughs> unless it's just super toxic and you can't, you just no way you can stay there. Um, you know, I don't want you to like ruin your mental health for that. But you know, it might be one of those things. Start, you know, maybe you could quiet quit, just get a paycheck, do the bare minimum. You know, I don't know. Um, but uh, but that's certainly something to to think about. I think it's a personal thing for everybody. It's hard to say. And, and you put in a follow up after that. So what if you're already at a point where you're ready to declare bankruptcy? What are some ways to dig yourself out of bankruptcy, assuming it's it's worth it? Oh man, well, you know, it's funny. I was actually, I mean, not everybody could do this. I think some people can do this and some people can't. But um, there's the opportunity to, you know, do a side hustle if you can, if you've done it before and you can sell something, you know, maybe that's something you could sell. I, it was funny, I was actually just talking to uh, Tommy Joko a couple weeks ago and he said something I, I'll probably never forget. Everybody has something to sell. You know, it could be you write an ebook, a guidebook of some kind, you know. If you're a career shifter, you might have the opportunity to go back to your old career for a little while. Um, and honestly, I mean, I don't think there's any shame in waiting tables or doing something else. If you absolutely have to get a job to make money, it might not be as much as you're making working at Facebook or Google or something. But if you can afford to do it, you know, there's no shame in getting a job waiting tables to just pay the bills. I mean, actors and and, and uh, you know, musicians and artists have been doing that for like forever. So I don't know, it's really hard to say. I mean, I, I would advise against taking on too much debt because I feel like that's gonna probably hurt you in the long run. Um, but if you have to take on more debt, you know, just try to have a plan to get out of relying on debt if you can. I don't want to be like a financial advisor, but I think that'll probably just like ruin your future self maybe more than like anything else. So I don't know. It's that, again, personal thing, like who, who can decide what they can or can't do. I think everybody's got a different tolerance for what they're yeah. willing to, to go through. You know? I think it's a very personal decision, you know. Um, so then we have another question here. How can one effectively address senior UX professionals who may lack UX maturity and suggest reconsidering certain decisions without undermining their authority or expertise? Mm, yeah, well, like, I think this goes back to like calling someone out in a meeting with a bunch of other people is probably not the best way to do that. Um, and someone who, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this question is geared towards a certain personality, but there are probably, I would imagine, a lot of senior anybody, designers, developers, whomever, who think they have it all and like are, refuse to admit that they are. There's a better way to do it. Um, I think calling them out in a meeting in front of other people is probably just gonna put their defenses up. Um, I think again, having those those one-on-one -on -one conversations, call them one-on-ones, call them just coffee chats, whatever you want, and talk through your idea, you know, assuming positive intent and they're not just giant assholes, you know, there's probably an opportunity to influence one way or another. Again, the allies, finding a, a peer, finding a few peers, somebody who might be able to also talk to them, you know, and, and, and influence them from the side. You know, maybe they could go up and influence from the bot, from the top. Um, so I think, I think again, I, I keep saying this, but like I think the coffee chats, the one-on-ones are probably the best way to influence people like that. I think doing it in a public meeting and a public setting is probably going to backfire, probably not work. All right. I'll do two more and then we'll let you go. I know we're kind of getting close to the uh, end of this year. Um, it appears that the relationship aspect of UX maturity is closely linked to the work culture. So in your experience, what specific activities or practices 
have proven to be effective in nurturing positive relationship within remote, remote work settings to enhance UX maturity. Yeah, well, oh, uh, so I've got a few things actually here. So my team, uh, we're remote. We're all in Cincinnati, most of us, but we've actually got people in Miami, New York. We've got people in New Orleans. We have people in San Francisco for a little while. Um, so we actually do a games, a weekly games, uh, remote games thing where we play like scribble.io or GeoGuessr or like one of these like remote games. And like our boss is really good about like making sure people know like it is perfectly fine to spend an hour doing this and you know not working for an hour because this fosters the really good relationships which just creates a higher performing team. Um, and so I think stuff like that is really important. You know, Slack, we have like a water cooler kind of thing. We call it like not dribble where we share like, you know, non UX stuff, like could be just stuff we're working on designs and stuff, you know, side projects, freelance projects, whatever. Um, but I think that stuff, like potluck, and, which is, you know, in person, but we do an office wide potluck where people get together and, and stuff like that. We're doing like a Halloween games thing. Uh, Sounds weird, um, but we have a team. Just a few of us that you know actively try to do a thing every month. We try to do an in-person thing every other month and a remote thing every other month, so we can do you know both uh, in-person and remote people getting together. Um, one of the guys that like does yard games. He's got like a, a truckload of like yard. He'll bring up the yard games and we'll do like a potluck, like a picnic potluck, and stuff like that. But remote um, is is hard. Um, it's a lot harder, I think. Um, one thing that. Um, Stephen Gates had a lot of really cool ideas, actually, in, in one of his episodes. This was like months ago, um, the Crazy One podcast about this. Uh, we did, it, we started doing something similar. He suggested like a like a cribs, where uh, you know people like show their off, you know, in a remote call. So I, I I'm in my closet. I don't know if you could tell, but uh, I'm actually this is like literally my closet. My clothes are here, uh, but I like showed everybody my office and like went through like my Legos and books and stuff on my shelf and things like that, you know. So there's opportunities to do stuff like that. I think the other thing that is, this is maybe more top down, but I think the manager would probably have to facilitate this. But um, I talked about communicating and everybody being able to communicate well with each other. Uh, type of personality assessment, just to get a sense, you know, it doesn't even have to be a personality test, but just some kind of thing. Like I like to communicate this way. I would prefer if you, you know, emailed me or I prefer a DM or I would prefer you walk over to my desk or whatever it is and having like a library with all those people, right? And I can read everybody else's, so I can see what yours is, I can see what Hong's is, you know? And then as we onboard new people, I can I can read all of the other ones and then I can see how everybody on the team likes to communicate, you know? Um, so that's a kind of like a cool little thing, I think, to help with some of that communication piece. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, I think it's probably gotta be like a top-down thing to make everybody do it, <laughs> you know, I don't know. And then again, you get like culture, like if you're making people do it, what is the culture like? I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, that's just like another idea that uh, that um, Stephen Gates recommended to show. We took that and started doing that. It was a really good idea. Yeah, I really like this Cribs idea. We're always looking for ways to engage our DEI students, which is an online program that we run here at the Stratford School. And we did Scribble.io and, and other stuff too to just foster that culture with people that are taking the course from all over the world. And so I like this idea that everyone does like a little walkthrough of the place where that's they work. Fun. I think that's very yeah, neat. Some people like what we found, some people just did not want to turn. So it's like, again, not forcing people to do it, but people who don't mind, you know, um, yeah. that's, that's just something to keep in mind. But anyway, we, we ran into right. some people who were like, no way. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's close it with a hand question, um, which uh, I'll let you Bring it decide on. on if you can quickly answer that or if that's a longer one. But was there a key moment or influence that turned young, cute Jeremy into crusty old Jeremy? <laughs> crusty old. I was having two kids. That's what turned me into that. No, honestly, um, you know, I think it, it was actually having kids, which is, you know, um, for me, realizing, like, where my priorities are. So it was just like, why am I fighting this thing? It's just like, this is just work. Like, it's just work. I'm going to leave it at work. I have so much other things to, to worry about. Um, but that was something, I mean, that was part of it. That was sort of like the idea of step letting go and being like, I can't do this. Um, but I can tell you actually, there was a very specific thing that happened back when I was living in New Orleans. Um, we had a team that had a stakeholder that was just a mean stakeholder. They were so mean. And what I realized was like, I think this guy is actually having other things wrong with him or not wrong with him, but like having other people neck and all these priorities. He came into town for work. And we all went out and we sang karaoke and stuff. And I got to meet the guy and I'm just like talking to him. And you know, he's just like a cool dude. 
And that was like when I realized I was like, this guy is actually pretty, pretty cool guy. Like, why is he like this at work? And so after he left and went back to Atlanta, we started doing a regular one on one every couple of months or every every. And his like attitude changed so much after we started having those regular conversations, because I think he he realized that we were. And we he realized, realized that he was a person, you know, because we all were together in this big. And after that, I think what I realized was like the those those relationships. It's not about the meetings. It's about the the like, it's about the dinner. It's about lunch. It's about you know, just shooting the shit, and getting to know people. And our working relationship changed, for the better after that workout, after that workshop. And that was one of the first times I was like, it's not about the work. It's about all the other stuff. You know, and so anyway, that was like 20, when was that? 2018. So that was like not that long ago, really. <laughs> you know, it did take take me a while to, to get to that point. But anyway. Okay, I think uh, with that, we'll close it off for today. Uh, that was a lot of questions. Thank you for being a good sport and answering all of those uh, for our listeners uh, online and uh, here in person. Uh, so let's give one more round of applause to Jeremy and say thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Cool. Thank and, you so uh, much. And I've got some, I've, good, you want me to send yeah. you the deck and stuff? You want to send that out? Yes, please. Cool. Please awesome. do, do send me the deck and the information so I can share it with everyone. Um, if you're following us online, um, just if, if you want any more information, feel free to reach out. And we will be making a, a, a more high resolution video of this available uh, later as well. And yeah, thank you again so much. So. Uh, one of the questions I have, so you might remember, we asked you for some feedback on how the lecture is going and what stuff to improve. And some of the things uh, were related to the guest lectures. Uh, so I just have a question. Is there anything anyone can think about that would make the guest lectures a little bit easier? Now, keep in mind, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury to say, okay, we're just going to turn this into like a half online class. I can't do that because that's just how the university operates. That's how the Stratford School operates. Um, unfortunately, these guest, guest lectures don't get a travel fee, so they can't actually come here in person. Uh, it was very hard to actually schedule them at the times that they have, because uh, some of them are in different time zones and so forth. Uh, so I'm actually very happy that they even found the time to do it online, but I know that that creates a weird dynamic of like an hour where you're kind of just like watching something on screen that's not in person. So I guess that gives this class a little bit of a hybrid nature. So any thoughts on like how to improve that from your end? Like how, how to make that more engaging? Any wild ideas? Nothing so far. Yeah? I personally like this lecture a lot more than the other ones because I felt like he was making more jokes and kind of was like really engaging with his storytelling. He's a great speaker, yeah. Yeah. That's that's the hit or miss, you know. Yeah. Like sometimes you get like amazing people and, and so I actually thought Amphisa was a really good speaker too, but I think maybe the content wasn't as related to what you guys are doing yet because it is more like once you're at the portfolio stage that that's more relevant. So with his, I think it's more like he actually talked like about general life skills today. So I think that's like really cool and something makes it so applicable. And he's he's a podcaster, so he definitely knows how to talk to people, so that helps, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, I will, uh, so the next one, that's also a little bit more on the academic end, so that should also be a uh, hopefully a very engaging one. Um, yeah, but anyways, any questions uh, or ideas about that? Nobody? Everyone okay to just continue like that? Okay. All right. Um, assignment two. You're currently working on it. How are you feeling about it? Have you had time to look at it yet? Or did reading week? So I, I tell you about my reading week. Um, we were running a conference at the Stratford School, so I didn't have a reading week. I was literally here from 8.30 in the morning until 11.30 at night. Those were very long days, and just like conference for a week. Uh, so there, there was my reading week. I don't know if your reading week was busy. Maybe you worked a job. Maybe you had some time to reflect. But did anyone have time to spend some quality time with assignment two yet? Okay. So if you, if you haven't, that's fine. Then I assume nobody has. So for those that have, 
and maybe have run into troubles, now would be a good time to ask because we can help. Um, if, if you haven't had time to look at it, that's fine too. Um, as you check it out, and if you have any questions, do send us a message, either me on Teams or Joe via email, um, and, and let us know if you run into any troubles with that. That assignment does need a lot of time, uh, so it requires some planning. So it's not an assignment you can pick up 24 hours before, I'll tell you that, right? Because like, you need to um, dedicate time and space to actually do the activity. Uh, so definitely, if you haven't even read it, I recommend read it today, because you need to plan that. That's not something that you can just do last minute, so you probably want to have a week of time to actually schedule the activities around it, okay? All right. Then we have Mini Challenge 3, which was scheduled for this week, but we still have a whole lot of cognitive task analysis to go through. Um, and I did check with Ali in the other section, and he didn't actually do Mini Challenge 3 today. So we're pushing Mini Challenge 3 back a week, if that's okay with you. It gives you a little bit more time to focus on the assignment, too, as well. Not stress out about it so much. And, um, and yeah, so that just kind of puts the Mini Challenges back one week. Uh, final groups. If you haven't let Joe know your final group, today is the last day. He said, did you say end of day or end of, end of five o'clock? What's, what's your end of day look like? Is it 12? Is it midnight? Seven, but it's seven. seven, okay. So by seven, let Joe know who you want to be in a group with. If not, that's fine. You know, we'll just make up groups. We're really good at that. But please take what we give you at that point. So you have a chance to influence that until seven o'clock today. Uh, please make use of that. <clears throat> and then you'll also, exciting, exciting, this is final groups, right? So you'll also get the design briefs next week. So to be able to work on those design briefs, we need to have the groups. And so we, we do need to make the groups this week. So there's no extension or, or we haven't had time. If we haven't received your group, we'll just make it, right? Because you need to be in that group next week so that you can start working on those design briefs. Okay. That's, that's that. That's about it for that. Now, cognitive task analysis and cognitive walkthrough. That's a lot of cognition. Does anyone have a clue what that is? Have you heard the terms before? Have you encountered anyone talking about this? <laughs> Never heard of it? This is completely news to you? Who is completely new to this? Okay, so, oh, yeah, there's a lot of people that know about this. Or you're just not into the hand raising business, but you've heard about it before. Basically, understand it's, you're trying to understand what the user is thinking while they're using the product. Yeah, product system or service. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's it's trying to understand. It's trying to remember some of these uh, first talks that we had about empathy, empathize, so important. So this is really at the heart of that, like understanding how they think and how they feel when they do something. But it also falls into this idea of evaluating user experience analytically. Now, analytic evaluation of user experience can be done in two separate or distinct categories, if you want. System side or interaction side, right? And system side, we've actually already toyed with in the past lectures because we've done, we've all done a heuristic evaluation. Who remembers <clears throat> what a heuristic evaluation is? All the hands should be up. Yes, over there. Um, it's like the evaluation of the new test design, um, implementing like Nielsen's 10 heuristics to analyze how well it Okay, so Nielsen produced a set of 10 heuristics that then, what do you, what do, you do with those heuristics? What's your job? And do you need users for that? I mean, we're talking about user experience here. So heuristics, do we need users for heuristics? Do we need people? Hmm? You've all done it. Everyone should be just like, I don't know if it's just a Monday. They should be like, I've done it. Did you do it with users? Did you do it with a person? You shook your head. No, there was no person there. You don't need a person to do heuristics, OK? So? They're very much on the system side. They're looking at exactly these two. They're inspection methods, right? Like inspection means, who knows Inspector Gadget? Is that just my generation or does anyone remember that? You too? Okay. What does Inspector Gadget do? 
infects things with a lot of different gadgets, right? So just imagine the heuristics are our gadgets, and we're using those to inspect the system, right? So just like inspector gadgets, because all the different arms and things, we got 10 heuristics. Or if you're, user, if you're reading some of the other books, people have expanded that, right? Like, so there's like 20 heuristics of X, and then 35 mobile game heuristics, and so forth. So there's a lot more, it's just Nielsen's are the most popular ones, so they're the ones we usually teach. But you can find way more heuristics out there, right? So the, the don't think that those are the only guidelines. They're just the most common ones that everyone knows about. They're the baseline that you should know if you go into UX. Okay, so those are inspection methods. So we're inspecting those design elements, but we're also looking at things that cause usability. Either, what are the two things happening to usability that can cause it to go? What are, what, are, what, what are the heuristics do? What do they tell us about the usability of a system? Hmm? Tough Monday. Everyone's just tired or not remembering what happened before reading week. Okay, so heuristics tell you whether a system is usable or not usable, right? So whether, like let's say feedback, okay? Feedback is a heuristic, right? Remember that? Who remembers feedback here? Who's, who's mentally aware and here? Feedback is a heuristic. And what did feedback do? What, what does feedback say? What does the heuristic say? Hmm? <coughs> Grind those gears. <laughs> what, what does it say? What do you remember from it? Please, somebody. <laughs> it's just like blanking out about those 10 heuristics. What's feedback about? Yeah. The system, the system should accurately, accuracy is the important bit, right? Accurate, accurately represent its, uh, um, yeah, what's happening inside the system, right? Like visibility of system status, for example. So it should accurately tell you what the status of the system is. It should let you know this is, you know, what's currently happening, not just random error messages. So the feedback should be accurate. It should represent exactly what's going on with the system. And it should be in real time. It shouldn't be just like after something has happened, right? Or like way after something has occurred. Okay, so both of these things, uh, usability related heuristics, and in this case we looked at feedback, so something happening right then and there. And if feedback happens, that's usually a good thing. Heuristic is checked, okay, so that's a good thing. Or if you don't check it, what is that? If a system doesn't meet a heuristic, what is happening with that system? Hello. If the system doesn't meet the heuristic, come on. What is happening if you don't check the heuristic? Everyone should know this by now. If you don't check the heuristic, what is happening? If the system or the service or the product does not fulfill the heuristic, you all done it. What is happening? <laughs> like, what is happening? Okay, come on. There probably needs to be changed if it's not effective. If it's, if it's not, if you don't check the heuristic, so if it doesn't meet the guidelines, yeah. then that's a flaw, right? Like that's a flaw. You've all been really good at pointing out those flaws in the websites, right? So if I don't check the heuristic, it doesn't, it, it's, it's flawed in that regard, and yes, I need to improve it. So I need to come up with a strategy on how to improve that specific issue, right? So heuristic evaluation is all about what causes usability issues or functionality, right? It's about the good and the bad things happening to usability. And then those are usually related either to software or to hardware. Anyone want to give me an example of what software is? You all looked at software for this exercise. What's software? Yes. Is it like uh, the part that is not the part? Yeah, like what? Example, concrete example. Uh, apps, apps, programs. Websites, programs, yeah, that's that, exactly. Hardware, what's hardware? Hard, hard drive, yeah. Do you interact with a hard drive a lot, though? No. So in terms of the interface, what would be a hardware interface that you actually touch? A mouse. A mouse, exactly. Or a keyboard, or a touch screen, that kind of stuff, right? So these heuristics can relate to software and hardware problems, right? So you can look at both. What did you look at in your evaluations? Just software, just a specific software, a website, right? So just be aware it, it goes beyond that. It can also go into hardware-specific issues. Now, this is the one side where we're just looking at a system and analytically evaluate the system. Then there's this whole other side of um, inspection where we look at the interaction. We turn our focus, instead of the system and saying, okay, the system meets those guidelines, we turn our focus on the user, okay? So this is an inspection of the user and how the user interacts 
And this is ta-da, today's lecture, okay? So this is what we do in a cognitive walkthrough. So a cognitive walkthrough, or as usability designers like to talk, call, call it, the cog walk, right? Uh, just a short form of it, is a way that you can find causal factors for any issues uh, that are apparent uh, and influence the user experience. So software features, task demand, user characteristics, or context. Anything that the user has appearing around them and relates to how well they can interact with the software. Again, keep in mind this is all about the interaction. It's not about the system, but it's about how we perceive the interaction. And that's where the cognitive walkthrough comes in, okay? So it is about finding out what users want to do and how they plan to do it in the UI, right? So what are these two things, how and why? What are we trying to understand here? What users want to do, so why are they doing it and how they're doing it? And then carefully thinking of the problems they will face as they learn to use the UI. That is very much about understanding, right? It's all about perception and understanding of the user and how the user understands the system. So again, related to um, the processing on the user side. And then that also means it's not just usability, because heuristics are just usability. But what's the other aspect that's important there is also the learnability. Have you ever heard the word learnability? What could it mean? I love that hat, by the way. The cord is awesome. I want one. Um, but OK, so learnability, what does it mean? Usability, I can use it. Learnability, you can learn it. You can learn it, exactly. And of course, in this case, how hard or how difficult or how easy it is to learn, right? That's learnability. When does learnability come into play with software? When do you ever have to learn software? What do you remember? When you're using the software for the first time. Exactly, like you get a tutorial, some, some sort of onboarding, right? So learnability is usually the first time user experience, or FTU, or FTUX, as we sometimes call it. Right? So first time user experience is really important, really important for video games, for example, because video games are all about that first time experience. It's all about the first hour, first half hour of play, and see how, how people are processing it. But you find that with a lot of other software as well. The first time using it is really important in how that onboarding happens. All right, so that's part of it. But just in general, a cognitive walkthrough is, of course, more than just one-time use, but it's about all the different uses. So when I'm talking about uses, I'm saying tasks, because the way that we define a use would be as a task. And, and what is a task? We'll talk about that in a second. But the idea that somebody wants to do something for a purpose. So a task is, OK, I want to achieve something by using that product, system, or service. OK, that's a task. And that's the task that a user needs to carry out. So to do a cognitive walkthrough, we need to understand what the user wants to do with your software, service, or product, the task. right? That's what you need to understand as you're trying to measure that walkthrough. Because the walkthrough is all about pretending to use the software for the first time. Software is not, it's usually done in a development stage, right? Software is not done yet. You don't really use it on, on completely done. Software you use it during design, right? So Cognitive Walks is all about the potential experience somebody will have. So we're going to do a lot of pretend and role play in this, as you'll see in a second, that helps us understand potential issue with that software. Then you're testing them, testing them, in terms of how easy it is to perceive and understand for the user. So, even before the feature is implemented or developed by the programmer, you're testing how the user perceives that feature in that cognitive walkthrough, in that cognitive role play about the interaction that's about to take place. Okay, so that's what that is. And so, oops. And so again, it's about both learnability and usability, but more about the learnability. And a cognitive walkthrough can usually be done before or at the early stages of development where you're in a workshop setting and uh, you're doing it with a group of people where different people take on different roles during that, um, during that walkthrough exercise. For example, if we go back to our online shopping that we had earlier, you can use a cognitive walkthrough to check if users can find the products that they want, add them to the cart and pay for them, right? Like that's a task. You want to find products, add products to the cart and pay for products. And then you're seeing, is that possible? Okay, 
So what are the roles in the cognitive walkthrough? First of all, you usually have a facilitator. And you usually have that with a lot of different UX uh, processes, whether you do a user test or something else. There's usually a facilitator. So a person that says, OK, this is how the session is going to unfold. OK, I'm going to help you unfold this. And sometimes the facilitator can be rolled in other roles if you don't have enough people. But if you have enough, a separate role for that is not bad. Then you have a presenter. And this is usually when you do paper prototypes. Anyone ever done paper prototyping, paper computers, this kind of stuff? Yeah. So you are probably familiar with that concept of the human computer, the person that shifts around the paper prototype. That's similar to what the presenter does. The presenter essentially demonstrates the prototype. Okay? And then we have the recorder. The recorder is usually the person recording the observation. Um, why don't we have multiple of that? We can have multiple of that, but usually it's better to have somebody just taking notes as other people are doing the actual evaluation. Uh, which is usually the UX researchers, designers, or product managers in the room, sometimes the engineers and field experts as well. But you have people evaluating whether that task can be achieved. Yes? So the recorders, are they just watching from a distance, or do you get any feedback from the actual person who's supposed to be doing it? No, that's what the evaluators do. So the evaluators are the ones prompting for the feedback, and that is usually the actual UX research job. And the recorder is usually somebody that is either pretty new or an assistant, or these days we do it a lot with. Um, automated note-taking and recording, because we have AI to just structure the notes for us after the, after the case, right? But back in the day, before we had all of that, you usually had a person actually doing that by hand. And I think there's a lot of cases where that is still very valuable, because somebody that's really highly trained can get really precise, good notes, and have observation, as well as listening skills that they to put into notes. If you just run a recording of an audio session or a video recording while you're doing it, that still needs a significant amount of time to process and parse. And I can parse audio really great, for sure, no problem. But the visual aspect and the video and just like perceiving the body language and all that stuff, that's really hard still. So you still need like uh, an actual human observer to, to do that and turn that into notes. So it's still often that you find an actual human doing that. And then the role is really just like being very perceptive, like taking all those notes. And that is actually what you're doing a lot in assignment two, if you've already looked at it. But yeah, so a lot of that challenge is exactly becoming a good recorder, like becoming a good ob recorder, observer, whatever you want to call it, right? Like often it's also an observer. But recorder, I think, is a little bit better because you usually record the audio as well as just the visual observation. So it's both together. You're just collecting a lot of that information, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, and, and there you can see, just by doing this, uh, essentially what happens is you're just going through a hypothetical use scenario. Okay? You don't have a real user in this scenario. Nobody is actually being the user. You're just recording the thoughts as people are going through this presentation of the prototype, right? Like it's all up to the presenter. So if, if you did a paper prototype, you usually did it in some sort of user testing. So you bring somebody in and you show them the prototype and then you observe that. Here it's different because it's just being shown and evaluated based on that showing and thinking, okay, can the person actually complete the task? Um, sometimes you can do it with participants as well, um, but a lot of the times people just do it before, at the stages before something is done, just to kind of get an idea of what that um, cognitive processing looks like. Um, so usually you have the prototypes already done, so either low fidelity or high fidelity, depending on what stage you are, are in the UX process. And then you have user personas and scenarios. So instead of actually having a user, you have that hypothetical scenario of what a user wants to achieve. And this is the specific user that wants to achieve that, that uh, specific outcome. Right? So you're preparing those detailed personas and scenarios for the evaluators to emulate. And then somebody just role plays as that and just kind of goes through that. So instead of actually being a user, you're just pretending you're that specific user, and that's the specific, the specific problem that you're dealing with. So then, uh, usually the presenter describes the user persona in the scenario in detail. You discuss the first action that the user would take. Again, it's completely hypothetical, right? Like, it's just like, okay, this is what the user would do in this case, based on the information that we have. So you're, you're very much putting yourself in the shoes of the user. And then you use these four questions, and that's really the heart of the cognitive walkthrough, is these four questions that you need to use to assess each action that's being taken. Will the user try to achieve the right result? Will the user notice that the correct action is available? Will the user associate the action with the result? And after the action, will the user see the progress? Okay, so that is what 
really, and we'll, we'll talk about what each of the question actually means, but that's really um, at the heart of a cognitive walkthrough, asking those four questions step by step, and then discussing the actions that the users might take. Again, you're at a very hypothetical stage, you're just kind of putting yourself into the user's um, mind here. And then you're documenting the insight, you're preparing a summary as usual, and then you would validate the hypothetical issues that you've identified here with real users. So you're like, okay, this is very likely a potential uh, thing. And then you have a guideline, again, a set of, of guidelines or potential things to look out for as you're preparing a real user test. So what does it help? Like, like why wouldn't, mom, why wouldn't I just do a real user test right away? Well, because now you have guided perception, right? So you could also call it a slight cognitive bias that you bring into this, but your bias is, of course, based upon this evaluation that you've done before. And so it just kind of helps you identify the issues maybe slightly quicker than if you'd have to do a full processing and, and looking through the uh, results that you've gathered if you just run the user study, okay? So again, rephrase this a little bit. Will the user try and achieve the right outcome? Will the user notice that the correct action is available to them? Will the user associate the correct action with the outcome that they expect to achieve? And if the correct action is performed, will the user see um, or it, 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 will the user see that the progress is being made towards the outcome that they intended? So the first question, will the user try and achieve the right outcome, examines whether the interface is making assumptions about a user's level of experience or level of knowledge that they have. And whether those, that, that previous knowledge that they bring to the plate, whether that's accurate or not, right? So is the interface fitting the user's previous knowledge? Is it fitting the context that they bring into this interaction? Again, keep, keep in mind, when we're doing a cognitive walkthrough, it's all about the interaction that is happening with the user interface that you've built. Again, I'm saying user interface because a lot of the times it's just a software user interface. So it's really just looking at the software interactions that you have in place. So it helps you identify where are the expectations from the user and what are the potential expectations that they have and do they align with the action that they would take if you're using other reference points and if they're potentially becoming confused. Again, keeping in mind that this is usually role played out in a way that you're assuming that persona based on the best of knowledge that you have about that uh, user. Um, and this could be something where, and, and you might say, you know, like, like why, how is this even a thing? Because again, it's, it's all about that empathy bit um, that is often just not done by developers or other people on the team, where it is really important to say, okay, uh, we've built this product, but the languaging in the product, for example, is inconsistent between other menu items that we have, or we're double labeling something. And if you're like putting yourself, or it is just not clear that, you know, this is the action that should be taken because it's not done in the language of the persona that we've assumed in that audience segment that we're building for, right? Um, maybe the thing that is called record at a camera action, action is called snap if it's like within Snapchat or for a younger audience, right? Like maybe it's just the labeling that needs to be different to reach that audience, reach that persona that you're intending to build for, right? Like these are the easiest things that you can find when you're building it like that. And if you're asking yourself, will the user try and achieve the right outcome, right? Um, Okay, the next question is, of course, will the user notice that the correct action is available to them? This is, of, of course, related to anything that's hidden or obscured, right? Like, whenever you've got a hidden or an obscured controls, that's a problem. And the more data that you can present for something being hidden, something not being clear for the user, the better. And this can be related to any kind of control items that you can have in a menu system, rather than having it present right there um, for the user to interact with and for the interaction to take place right away. This is very interesting because it relates back to cognitive task analysis, which we'll talk about after this, where we're trying to understand the tasks that the user is trying to do. In cognitive walkthrough, we already have a task, right? So we're already assuming there's a specific task for which we're doing the walkthrough. Find a picture, put a thing in your shopping bag, some, do this specific thing, right? So those are tasks and every task is of course related to um, a menu item or a menu interaction that you're trying to do, trying to navigate through a tree, trying to press a button, these kind of things. So <clears throat> the real life examples uh, that you have uh, or that you might know for this, uh, hardware related are uh, TV controls, right? Um, so you usually have TV controls that have a whole number of options on them 
And um, yeah, like who, who's recently used the TV controls? Anyone watching TV in this room? Okay, what does your TV control look like? Ten buttons. Yeah. So are the buttons all the same size? Somewhat. Okay. Is there like a button that sticks out? Um, like the arrow buttons, because they're right in the middle and they're the big ones. Okay. And then different color buttons, like the on and off buttons. Okay. Yeah. So that's already quite interesting, right? So uh, usually the, the 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 problem that manufacturers are trying to do is they they are trying to do one function buttons, but because it's a TV, there's more than one function. To do and the way that they've addressed it recently is to give you an on-screen menu and then just give you navigation bits and pieces where you have left, right, and even Apple does it with the little dial and the up, down, left, right, so that now you can navigate. So they're taking the menu problem away from the interface, the hardware interface, and putting it on the TV because now you have to navigate the menu on the TV instead of navigating it in your hand. Back in the day when we had CRT TVs and that kind of stuff, not that I was alive back then, but um, the, the way that you would interact with these televisions would be with a very sturdy control that has all of the things just on the hardware because there was no on-screen interface. There was no menu there. So everything had to be placed on there. And then when that transition came to on-screen menus, manufacturers didn't really catch up with it. But so now you have these hybrid remotes, which usually have like the big buttons that say, OK, but you can navigate on the thing. But then they usually have one, two, three, four, whatever for the programming channels button to provide that kind of input. And all of them usually have one big on-off button uh, because that's the, the main one that you want to find to just turn the, the TV on or off. So with these things, uh, if, you, if you wanted to try a, a cognitive walk, uh, remote control is the best thing to do because depending on what task you want to do, other than turning the TV on or off or um, finding a right channel, everything else might be slightly obscure. Anything that requires a setting brightness setting or anything other than that will be a rather challenging task on your TV remote because you will ask yourself, will the user notice that the correct action is available to them just by looking at the remote? And the answer is probably no, unless it's on, off, or switching to a channel. Those are the two ones that they will probably be available depending on your remote control, but the other ones will actually be harder to do, right? And so then the question is, you know, how do we make that easier? And if you were, for example, to redesign a remote control or something along those lines. Um, so that's a key question to ask, you know, will they notice the correct action available to them in a sea of other opportunities maybe? And then will the user associate the correct action with the outcome that they expect to achieve? So if, uh, again, if your languaging is, is poor and you use complex words or industry jargon for something, uh, then it can be really hard to work out what's, what's needed to achieve the outcome that you desire, what's needed to achieve the task. Uh, this is also true when you do complex actions. I don't know how many of you have are now masters of the screenshot on the Mac OS. And how many of you struggled the first time you had to figure out that three finger shortcut, four finger, I think, four shortcut, three finger shortcut um, for getting those screenshots right, right? Like Mac is great for doing like screenshots and screen crops. You can just do it right there, right? Like it's, it's much easier than starting snipe, snipping tool on, on, on it's called sniping tool. To a snipping tool on Windows uh, where you can actually you know, select something and it has the same functionality now, but Mac had that way before Windows introduced it, right? And so on a Mac, once you knew that shortcut, you could actually very easily take screenshots and you could find them and so forth, right? But that's a high cognitive load and a complex action that's available. So will the user associate the correct action with the outcome that they expect to achieve? Probably not, unless they've been really trained how to do that. And some people, I remember myself, when I learned it, I had little sticky, sticky uh, note things on my keyboard that said, okay, these are the three buttons you need to press for, the, uh, for, for getting into that menu. It's the same with Control-Alt-Delete on Windows, right? Like, if you're not a Windows user, then it's like, okay, so I need to press Control-Alt-Delete to actually get into that task manager and, and reboot my uh, PC, right? It's the same on a Mac, right? Like, knowing to press Command-Q or uh, other shortcuts that uh, allow you to um, do certain things at the operating system level are really hard to find and associate with the outcome because they're not intuitive, right? So that's really interesting. And if you remember, I did talk about Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think. If you've read it or if you're interested in reading a good book, that, that's the one to read. And he always advocates that every click needs to be a mindless choice. As soon as 
you have to put effort into it, is not good according to him, right? So again, our goal that we strive for in UX and that the more we strive for it, the more we see it not being achieved by a lot of interfaces that we even deal with in our daily lives is exactly that. So will we be able to associate the correct action? Uh, is it an unambiguous choice? A lot of the times, no. <clears throat> and then the last one is, of course, if the correct action is performed, so okay, I've done the correct action, will the user see that the progress is being made towards the intended outcome? So that, again, is a little bit related to this idea of feedback because it will help you investigate whether the feedback of the system is missing or whether it's badly worded, whether it's easy to miss, or plain old unambiguous. Um, one of the things that I had to struggle with a lot, and again, this is related to uh, submission systems and uh, server-based systems, is um, whenever Ajax, I think back when it was Ajax before, it ended up being more responsive web, web technology. But when Ajax was introduced, um, what was the big thing that came about uh, that nowadays you have on all of the social media sites where you just click a, a like button and then it automatically, it's not even a like button, right? It's just like a, an icon that you click and then something happens. But before that, it was actually like just a button. We had to click a button for something to happen. Nowadays, we can select something from a drop down menu. Uh, we can type in text and then shift out of it, and then it will complete that text and add the text with. And then oftentimes we don't have to click a save button anymore, right? I think Quest actually does that on, on the Waterloo server. I think there was something uh, in Quest where you didn't actually have to put, uh, submit confirm, um, which was super weird because for the longest time Quest was like the buggiest thing ever, and you had to click all of the different buttons. So you had, pretty much you had to do your pre-selection, choose your options, and you had to click save. If you didn't click that save button, all of your options were lost, right? I think there's still lots of parts of Quest that work that way. But some parts, now you can just select, and learn is the same way. Like, and learn some parts, you can just select, drop down, and then it will just do that. It will just automatically apply whatever choice that you've selected instead of having to click that extra button, right? And this is really interesting because it's the same thing. Uh, I, can, I can give you the male, pers uh, a male uh, perspective on that. So it's the same thing. Uh, that if you go to a male urinal, uh, which I usually like stand in front of it, urinals uh, that you have here at the Stratford School, and then you go to some of the ones on main campus, let's say an old engineering building, like here they are all um, using infrared light to show the distance when you're standing in front of it, you're peeing, you're leaving it, and then it flashes automatically, right? So everything is just triggered automatically. You don't have to touch it or do anything. And then you take, you build a mental model about that. Let's say you're a Stratford student, You've, you've grown up with these urinals here on campus, and then you go onto main campus in one of the old buildings where there's like two or three levers, or if you go into uh, chemical, I think, somewhere, it's like foot pedals, and I think they have them for hand washing too. They have to like, like click on a, uh, step on a foot pedal instead of using the faucet and things like that. So all of a sudden, your mental model doesn't apply anymore. The intended action is not there anymore, right? So the interesting thing is, once we build those mental models, it's really hard to change them. So intended outcome is very much related to the user mental model. So why is it good to do that in a hypothetical cognitive walkthrough? Because you can empathize with these models if you're looking at that specific user, right? This is why it helps frame it for that specific persona, that specific scenario, as in this is what the person is trying to do well, but then this wouldn't be the logical consequence because this other action happened before that. So you can see how they are related. Okay. So along those lines, of course, we also have to understand cognitive task analysis because as we're going through a cognitive walkthrough, we also have to think about how do we create those tasks and what are ways for us to cluster and create them very efficiently. So cognitive task analysis helps you understand how users think and when they interact with the system. And of course, really designing better and more intuitive interfaces as you're trying to understand this uh, cognitive task analysis. So why would I use cognitive task analysis? Because by understanding it, you understand the cognitive processes that uh, happen, and then you can create designs that users find intuitive, and that, of course, has the result that it's more enjoyable to use. Uh, you have reduced errors, so that means when you understand the thought process, you can design systems that minimize mistakes. That's the same as the cognitive walkthrough overall. If you're designing something where people are less likely to do an indirect mapping between their mental model and the actual outcome, they make fewer errors, which means they're happier users. And then, of course, if you're matching the assumption of the user, 
you can complete the tasks faster and time saved is of course a really compelling argument for um, doing these types of tasks. Um, so really at the heart of it is that you're trying to identify the task and the goal at the start of your cognitive walkthrough. And so to define the task and the goal, uh, you really need to understand what you actually want to analyze, right? Like what is this cognitive um, walkthrough about? What is the actual task? And again, if I give you an example here, a task can be something very simple that you would do in real life. And then how does it map onto the software? Like buying a book online, okay? So buying a book online is a task. That's a task description. The goal is finding the best book for your needs and your budget. So that's kind of narrowing down the task. But then, does that make it easy for you to actually execute the task? How many of you would be able to do a task that's just saying find a book online? How many of you would would be able to do that just based on that description? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. And then, so if you're able, if you're able to complete uh, the task uh, based on, okay, I kind of know where I want to buy my book. You probably go to Amazon or whatever your favorite book uh, retailer is, and then you try and do that checkout process and try to get the book right. How valuable would it be for somebody that's now analyzing your um, task and, and doing cognitive task analysis? Um, how valuable do you think would it be for them if they just had that one task, buying a book online? How much could they improve about buying the book online? If you just said, well, here's app A, I'm buying a, buying a book online on, let's say, Amazon, and then I'm buying a book online on Apple Books or whatever, whoops. Um, and then you're comparing those two. So what insights do they get about improving the specific task about buying a book online? What do you think? Do they get insights? What, what would those insights be, if any, if you're just comparing those levels of the task? Yeah. Just thinking about when I, for example, go to book look and I have to find a book, I have to think about what am I going to type into the search bar. I'm going to type in the, the title of the book, the author, if I misspell it, even a little bit, the results don't show up, maybe that could be something that... So you're already doing it. What, what you're doing right now is a cognitive task analysis. So, so pretty much, yeah, so the, the idea is, if I just buy a book, it's usually not enough. If I just specify the task, it's not enough. So usually what I want to do, and again, this is why I, I can actually use cognitive task analysis beyond just the cognitive walkthrough. I could do it in an observation with participants, right? Um, because there... I would want to specify uh, specifically how um, each subtask of the task is done, how fast each subtask is done, how many errors I produce in, produce in each subtask. So you can apply all of those usability principles to each subtask that you specify. So part of cognitive task analysis is that breakdown into all the, the mini tasks that it's made out of. And I have a slide um, about that coming up in a second. But first I wanted to say, that is also why cognitive task analysis can be used with real participants, whereas cognitive walkthroughs might just be um, used w without any users. So here, when you're doing cognitive task analysis, you're thinking about who are the users who perform the task, what are their characteristics, motivations, and ex expectations, and what is the context in which they perform the task. All of this helps you break down the actual task, like what you just did. Okay, you used yourself as the, the main user of that, and this is, I would go on to book look, this is my process, right? And you would break it down for yourself. And so in a similar way, you would break it down for a persona. You would take a persona and say, okay, this is how that specific persona, student of Stratford School or whatever, would do this specifically for this subject. And then, uh, what is the context in which they perform the task? You know, where do you usually buy your books? At home, in front of my computer, together with classmates? Do I get input while they sit next to me? All of that conf context influences how the task is done. So it, uh, it helps you break down the task into a specific, a distinct representation of the task and, and then a way to, for others to be able to analyze that task. So first of all, you want to understand this, the target audience. And then you want to have a sample reflecting your user base to get accurate results if you want to test the cognitive task analysis, if you want to test the task that you're putting in front of people. So people who need a book for their course could be the audience, and the context could be their home or a school computer if they're, if they're in school and they're wanting to do that. And then the big thing would be breaking the task down. 
So a task is essentially broken down into all of these intrinsic factors. So as you're trying to specify uh, the task cognitively, you have all of these bits attached to it. So the smaller parts are usually knowledge, and then it's required knowledge and base knowledge. What would you say is required knowledge for you to buy a book? The name of the book, the name of the author. Exactly. Name, uh, title of the book, and name of the author. Let's say those two would be absolutely required. Without that, you can't buy the book, right? And <laughs> what would be base knowledge? What do you think could be base knowledge in that regard? So required knowledge is everything you need. Oh, I'm all over this thing. Um, everything you need for completing the task. That's the required knowledge. So what? What's the the base knowledge um, that you might need to uh, look for a book online? What's the base knowledge? Might not be directly related to the task of knowing what the book is but it might be related to getting that task done. Hmm? Exactly, how to use a website, how to use a search bar, how to, yeah, how to find a URL in the first place. You gotta get there, right? Like it's the base knowledge of the actual interaction that's about to take place. So the base knowledge is what is expected of the user when starting the task. So do they, are they already on the website? Do they have to type that in? Um, what are you giving them as they're starting to create that task? And, and then, of course, you don't just need the knowledge, but you also need a trigger. What's a trigger, usually? What's a trigger? It's too obvious, isn't it? Something that will prompt you to do the task. Exactly. It's, it's something that will prompt you or the motivation that you have. It's what makes you actually do the task in the first place. Yeah. Often it's some internal motivation. Sometimes it's the lecturer saying you got to buy this book for the course. Or it can be something like, oh, man, I just got like a huge inheritance. Now I want to buy books. Yeah, that ever happens, right? And, uh, and <laughs> you go and, and you buy all those books. It's the motivation that you have to start a task. That's the trigger, right? And then artifacts. What could artifacts be as, as we're thinking about a task? What's an artifact related to that task? It's, it's not the stuff here, but it's more on the system side now. This is how the system influences the interaction. That's why I ominously call it an artifact. Otherwise, I could have given it a more specific name. What's, what's an artifact that we need to order a book online? Hmm? Your desktop picture, your laptop. Your exactly, that stuff. The, the tools or the information that we require, whether it is the website, the laptop, the keyboard, um, all of that stuff. So all of the tools and the information that a user uses to be able to process the task, yeah? everything that helps you process the task specifically, those are artifacts, right? So <clears throat> it's, it's specifically asking, you know, um, so if we wanted to phrase that as questions, we could phrase it as, Trigger, what initiates the task for the user, desired outcome, how will the user know if they have successfully completed the task? And this is actually interesting because we didn't really check about that before, but every task needs to have an outcome attached to it, right? So outcome means something that's usually related to the task ending. Otherwise, how do we define a task? The task is a trigger, which starts the task, then the task has a process, the task is ongoing, and then the task ends, so the task gets completed. So there's usually a desired outcome, and desired means, what, why, do we, why don't we just say outcome? Why do we say desired outcome, usability-wise? What does that imply? That there's probably an undesired outcome. What's an undesired outcome, usually, in usability terms? Something's not going right. What is it? It's going wrong. Hello? Anyone still with me? Hmm? The ability to complete your task? Are you settled? Ability, of course. Ability to complete the task. But in this case, the outcome, so you would say then the undesired outcome is the inability to complete the task, yeah? Would that be your argument? Right. So what's the inability to complete the task? That is usually a result that is not completing the task or an error, right? So something 
that is an error or a mistake where you're just not completing it, you're not getting to the outcome. So error is usually anything that uh, prevents you from completing it in the way that you wanted to complete it. We call that an error because that's how it um, modeled an outcome that was undesired for you. So you want to know how do you, or you want to ask the users, how do you know that you've com successfully completed the task? Which is why we usually have a goal as we're modeling these tasks. This is what I want to achieve. Where does satisfaction come with the desired outcome? Desired outcome. If, if, if you achieve the desired outcome, you're satisfied as a result of it. But right? what if it was very challenging to get to your outcome, and then you're not satisfied because you still got it after? Yeah, so then you, that, that's where the breakdown comes in. Then if, this is all related to process, whereas this is related to outcome. So if you're not satisfied with the process, you've got to look at the breakdown of the process and which part of the process specifically the dissatisfaction comes from, which is, again, why we want to break down the task into these subcomponents so that we can say, was it because I was just not motivated to do the task? It wasn't attractive enough for me to do the task in the first place? Or was it because the tool was really bad and it was just like really bad communication? Then we can drill that down into more subtasks of the artifact. Or was it just because I wasn't provided with enough knowledge and I just didn't know how, right? And so then you can break that down into these subcomponents. But by, by being able to break down the task into these subcomponents, you can really drill down what is actually the problem for the user in that case, right? And that's the, that's the whole goal of cognitive task analysis. You want to be able to find what are the problem points, where do they come from as you're trying to do the task, right? So that you really understand um, why people are not able to achieve these tasks. Okay. And then, of course, as, you, as you're doing these task analysis, ideally you want to collect data. Um, so you can collect it by observing users, interviewing them, asking them to think about while they're performing a task. Again, cognitive task analysis you can usually do specifically as the users are completing the task. And then you're observing what's happening, and then you're drilling it down specifically based on what the users are doing. So how do users actually go about completing the task? That gives you a lot of insights about each of those subcomponents of the task. And what are the steps that they take? <clears throat> One of the steps that they take is really interesting because it actually helps you break down your cognitive task analysis more because your decision modeling might not be exactly how the user is actually doing their step-by-step -step decision modeling. They might have a, a whole different process. They might be going to that website and saying, okay, I'm going to book log or whatever. I'm going to type in the title of the book. I want to achieve the book. But guess what? If the cover is not blue, I'm not buying the book because I'm only buying books with a blue cover. Okay, now you've got this weird extra decision making in there. You're trying to understand, so why is that? Why is the user kind of so obsessed with blue? Now, this is, of course, a very silly example, but there might be other factors that are really specific about the user's decision making that you're trying to understand. And again, this is where it comes down to um, narrowing it down to a persona and a scenario for that specific demographic. Because again, it might not be the same for everyone, but you want to identify the issues as they occur. And this relates to, of course, then accessibility concerns as well, which is what your point was. Because let's say somebody's colorblind, right? Like, and this colorblind person is not able to distinguish the book's first and second edition just because they were just in, in weird colors that they couldn't uh, easily distinguish, right? And all of a sudden, it, the decision-making process is hindered within that specific moment where they're trying to make a decision. Okay, should I get the first or the second edition of the book? Again, we're like in this book example, but there's, of course, much better examples than just choosing books in an online um, uh, store. Okay. So... That's, that's the idea, you want to collect the data. Uh, based on that data, you want to refine your cognitive task and you want to be able to then, of course, as you analyze the data, you want to identify the cognitive aspects of the task. This is why it's called cognitive task analysis. So what is actually going on in the user's brain as they're completing their task? What are the patterns and what are the bottlenecks that you can observe? So this requires you to really put yourself in the user's head and think about the mental processes that users use to perform the task. What is actually going on, specifically based on those um, units that we talked about earlier, whether it's the artifact, the required knowledge, base knowledge, whether it's the triggers, or anything else related to that. Um, think about the knowledge, skills, strategies, and assumptions that they rely on. Again, a lot of that is the background knowledge, and a lot of that can actually be broken down once you create a much more complicated diagram. Now, the diagram that we had was pretty simple, right? It was just like giving you an overview of those different categories. But usually, as you're creating a cognitive task analysis, you're creating rather complex diagrams that go really deep into those cognitive tasks and help you understand um, what is actually going on, how the processes are being broken down. And 
um, this really highlights where you want to improve the design of, of the specific um, user interface that you're developing or the system as a whole. Um, so have you ever heard of decision trees or knowledge maps or something like that? Decision trees. Everyone should have maybe heard of, like what, what, what would the decision tree be? What do you think? Like how could decision trees be helpful when we're doing cognitive task analysis? Where do, where do decisions factor into cognitive task analysis? What do you think? I talked a lot about decisions earlier. Dependence and all. Decisions, uh, but within the task, like for example, the book example, are you gonna, uh, on book look, there's the part where you can search for text, course textbooks by either course or just typing in the instructor's name or something like that. Yep. And you can, what, what which one am I gonna choose? That's a decision. Depending on what you choose, there's gonna be a different set of options that you do next. That's another decision. That's a tree. So, what do you think is important as you're So obviously you said the user is making a decision, right? So they're deciding something based on information that's provided to them. Okay, so do I search that book or not? I mean, that's the ultimate decision, right? Or you have pretty much somewhere down the line here, you either have purchase or not purchase book, right? But then along those, those lines, you usually have like a, a bunch of a sub trees, right? So Somewhere here, before you reach all the way down there, you might have, um, there's, there's a, a big rebate button, okay? You know, do I click the rebate button or not? So you have, uh, usually click or not click. No. You actually have that quite often. You know, do I click on this UI element or do I not click on this UI element? And then you have another decision, is usually an expand decision. Do I expand to find the text or not expand to read the text? It's usually an information system. Do you have text that's hidden uh, in UI containers where it's like more information or less information? Okay? Um, so along those lines, you kind of navigate through this decision tree, and eventually you'll be at this or you'll be at that. It's just somewhere along those lines. And then you usually have those outcomes, probably we duplicate them a lot. You have those outcomes quite a bit. Uh, at the end of the decision tree. So the decision tree just helps you model your path. Again, the idea is here, we want to model what's going on in, in the user's brain, and not so much what's going on on the website. So it's all about um, when you're creating these nodes, as you say, in the decision graph, when you're creating those nodes, you have to think about, okay, so is this an, in, uh, is this an action that the user could take or not take? So that's essentially, with all of the decisions, it boils down to, action or no action, right? Like, is this an interaction happening or an interaction not happening? And then you have to ask yourself why, of course, right? Because this just models what is actually happening, and then as you're doing the analysis of the cognitive task, because this is really just the task itself, you want to look at, okay, so why are people just going through the decision tree without a certain pattern, or why are there bottlenecks where they're just like, they can't make that one decision because it's either too complicated, it's too obscure, or something else is happening. Right, so this is why diagramming it really helps. Again, that's just a tree, but the tree could be embedded in a flowchart or something where it's just like, okay, I arrive at this state and then I have to make this decision based on these input factors size, um, uh, visual complexity, uh, text input, and so forth, stuff like that. Everything that influences my decision could be something like context, uh, and it could be but then there's motion present and other things, right? Like anything that's related to the UI at that, case, uh, at that stage. And yeah, and then you wanna identify um, how can we counteract or leverage any of these patterns and bottlenecks that are present in that moment. <clears throat> okay, so at the very end then, you want to come up with insights and recommendations. And the idea here is essentially that based on your findings of the cognitive task analysis, you want to create profiles 
and recommendations that summarize how different users think. Okay, can I get some feedback on like how would you do that? How would you summarize how different users think? What would be your process for the output of a cognitive task analysis? How would that look like? What do you think? What would be your preferred way of summarizing this based on stuff you've done in the past? Okay, the boss is asking you to do it, summarize it. How would you do it? Uh, that would be interesting. So I would look at maybe like age groups and how maybe older people are more likely to be one way than younger people. Okay. Kind of like how they navigate. So you would categorize based on your initial demographic yeah. data or personas, whatever have you, and then you would present it by persona, yeah. right? Not a bad idea because then you're very targeted. You're targeted because every task as I said earlier, so you paid attention, is based on, of course, the persona and the scenario that they're in. So clustering it by persona and scenario makes a lot of sense, but what, what would then, what would make it actionable? Like summarizing how they think, like would you say all of them think the same way or would you then, like what would be the next step within the personas that have been given? Like how would I make that more actionable? based on additional insights that I've collected. Do you have the answer for that? Um, not for that, but I was thinking maybe you can like record, like have them record their decisions that they make along the path, and then you can like have like all of the data now, and you can see where they get stuck along the way to the final goal. Exactly, so you could, if, you, if you're if you in that persona group, you could then visualize it as a decision tree or as a, as a flow diagram or whatever, and how would you visualize that as you're essentially creating averages of the decisions? Any ideas on what's a good way to visualize that in, let's say, if we had a flow chart or something along those lines? If you want to say, okay, I want to visually emphasize these things where a lot of people are running into pattern X. What's a good way to visually emphasize that? You already know that. You have enough graphic design background. How do I visually emphasize something? Bold it. Bold it. You use a thicker outline, right? You maybe for the other stuff you add some transparency you make everything else a little bit more uh, or a little bit less uh, visually um, coherent significant right a little bit less stand out uh, and so then you could say okay here's my entire tree or here's my entire flow chart and this is kind of where most and then you're kind of close to these cognitive heat maps almost right because what a heat map is essentially it shows where clusters are, clusters of interaction. Heat maps you usually know from um, eye tracking and, and visual heat maps, which show us specifically what area of an interface people look at. And then you have these areas that are looked at a lot, are usually red or they have like a strong overlay and they look almost like a, a geographic height map, like a topographic map, um, where you can see, okay, these are the areas that people really had some long time, or spent some long time looking at. And in a similar way, you could then say, these are the tasks, or the, this, this, these are the decisions that a lot of people did. So this is like the dominant way to use, or to achieve this task with our app, with our system. And now you have a dominant strategy. And then, is that good or bad? Like, like what do you do with that knowledge? If you have that understanding, and if you know this is the most efficient way, let's say, to achieve this task with our app. As a UX designer, how do you make that applicable? Like if your boss asks you, so what? Okay, so now I know this, like, but what do you do? What's your insight? What's your recommendation to the team then? Now you gotta think outside the box, or maybe inside the box. How would you make this actionable? I'm asking you, we are a multi-million dollar company. I need to redesign Facebook tomorrow. Here's the stuff from your study. Give me a recommendation for how I'm redesigning this giant website. How would you do that? Mm -hmm. I look at like their <coughs> maybe their demographics because I know Facebook is like an older. You've already looked at their demographics. You have the you have the cognitive map in front of you. You have the task analysis. How do you make the cognitive task analysis actionable? You have your flowchart, your diagram. You let's say we have even outlined the things that are the most uh, used um, branches in the map. We have the most efficient workflow through achieving a task. Maybe the task on Facebook is sharing your mom's post, right? Like the, the most efficient way now for sharing your mom's post. 
How do you make that actionable to the to Mark Zuckerberg, Happy Valley? Kind of confusing. Make this happen. I'm kind of confusing. Like the like like Mark Zuckerberg's coming in. And he's telling asking him. you, yeah, it's asking you. Like you you're presenting this to him, yeah. and he's like, so what? So now you've presented this cognitive bias analysis. You're like, hey, you know, this is kind of what they're doing that. And he's like, so what do I do now? So how do you how do you, do you tell him the most obvious? Is of course you would tell him what you would tell him. Okay, this is what you are doing. Do exactly this. No, is that what you would say? I guess you tell the programmers to like make it. I, I don't know. The, the trick, the trick, and this is why this is a difficult question is, you now need to reflect upon your own UX work, right? You've created something that is, ideally, let's call it the optimal solution. It's the most efficient way to complete the task. But now you really need to reflect upon it to actually ask. Okay, so I'm in the mind of that specific demographic that we've identified. What was it again? Senior citizens? No. Yeah, so old and young. We got the senior citizens and the younger citizens. We've got two personas that are, you know, the moms that want to be added on Facebook by their sons or daughters, uh, and then the other way around, right? And so now we've got this weird dynamic where we want to make it really easy for this demographic, but really easy for that demographic, and we know the easiest way for each of them to achieve that. Is that what we recommend? Or now, do we need to reflect on the process of, okay, this is segment A, this is segment B, there's something missing here, no? Do you? I was just, the next question I need to ask is, is this a problem for the users? Is it, if they're not, if for example, users are, most users aren't using the most efficient path to getting to the final outcome, is that a problem for the business, or is this easier for the users than let's just leave it the way it is? So yeah, you need to clarify whether those results that you have are actually based on user data. Because if we already uh, asked the users during the process of creating the cognitive path analysis, it would already be maybe based on user output, right? And then we'd already have that information. But if we didn't, that is absolutely the first thing you gotta ask. Is this actually, does this actually apply to actual real user problems or not? So that's good, but let's assume we already have collected that data from users and they're telling us that. So basically how do we reconcile or consolidate those two different user groups that we're dealing with? Any ideas? Because dominant strategy A for user group A might be different for, do so the dominant strategy for the young uh, people of doing this specific activity might be counterproductive to the dominant strategy of group B that wants to achieve the same task. So what's the way around this that, I mean, these, these are not easy things to do, right? Like for any interactions, I know that's gonna be a struggle, but what are ways that big companies work around these things? Um, and I'll give you another example because I don't think Facebook is a great example for that, but let's go with Adobe, right? Like in Adobe Photoshop, and so you got, uh, or any Adobe product really, but let's go with Photoshop, maybe, or Premiere, some of the more common ones, okay? So you've got different people, let's say Premiere, let's say video editing. Everyone here loves video editing? You're all done video editing? Hopefully you've touched Premiere at some point? Okay, so Premiere, you've got different people working with that workspace, right? Different people have different tasks, have different goals. So you've got the editors coming in, doing editing stuff, you've got the VFX people that are doing the visual effects stuff, you've got the sound editors coming in doing the sound editing, and then you've got the directors coming in like wanting to look at the vision. And then you got the social media people that are just wanting to do their social clips with it. And funnily enough, Premiere does all of it. How, do they, how did they figure out to make that workable all within the same program with all those different user task scenarios behind you? Yes? Oh, you gotta see a little bit. So what, what does the customization of the workspace do, you know? Exactly, so the alignment of those windows, or containers, however they call them, is probably based on the most pertinent tasks that that specific demographic wants to achieve, uh, or the most important outcomes that they want to achieve within their specific work uh, or task set, right? So that's how they would do it. They would essentially allow you, and, and how do they customize it? How, how do you do it? Does it just automatically find out that you're an editor or you're a sound person? How, 
How does that customization happen? Anyone know? Someone that's like asking when you sign up, they ask you, what, what are, are you going to use this for schoolwork? Is this for work or just personal stuff? Yeah, this is actually the holy grail of interaction design currently because right now a lot of it is self-select, right? So they just let, let you self-select or maybe they'll give you a persona when you sign up. Okay, I'm a UX designer. Like there's a lot of UX tools that actually have like I'm the product manager, I'm the UX researcher, or I'm the designer. And then based on that initial quiz, they will present a different user interface to you. Uh, so that's self-select. And it's the same with Adobe, right? Like select your workspace, we will uh, assign the workspace to you based on your choice. That's self-select, very common probably the industry standard right now. And then we have this idea of adaptive, adaptive UI, adaptive customization. Does anyone have any ideas on how that works and like why that's also risky? Like what would somebody use to make this adaptive then? Keep in mind, it's cognitive task now. How are they gonna get into your head? Any ideas on how somebody could get into a user's head before they start using the program? What are the most common ways to get into somebody's head? How do you do it in, in your own UX research? How do you get into somebody's head? How do you get insights about people? Huh? You don't stick like a plug in there and matrix down, just download it. You ask some questions. Exactly, you ask some questions, yeah. Most common way is just to ask some questions, do like a little survey or something like that. And then based on that data, you do a customization, yeah? So you could have a little entry survey, a little exit survey, a little pre-survey, whatever. Um, or you could also just observe them. This is another way. Uh, and you know that yourself. Behavioral tracking, right? Like behavioral metrics. Uh, so you could observe them based on their interactions that they do in the interface. Maybe somebody's like always clicking through like complicated menus, uh, like me, to get to the sound editing part of it. I figured it out by now. Um, but then always to do the sound and then switch back to the editing, yeah? And then all of a sudden could, could come up and say, hey, by the way, did you mean to change it into this specific direction? Because that might make it much easier, much more workable for you. And so that is basically adaptive suggestions based on tracking and performance data, right? So there's another thing where it might, you know, ask you to self-select at the start, but if you don't, and this is interesting, this is why cognitive task analysis is Interesting in that case, because let's go back to that. Because if you self-select, what are the two things that could maybe cause an error there in the self-selection? Because you might not actually have the required knowledge to self-select, right? Like if you're new to Premiere, you don't know if you're the sound or VFX person or like wh what exactly that workspace does for you in that case, right? So you're gonna have to acquire that knowledge first. So being able to break this down into these components really makes it easy as you're designing the interface. Keep in mind, this is just on the user side. As you're breaking down in the user and emphasizing with the user as maybe not knowing how to do the task X, you can then make it more adaptive. Yeah, and that helps you um, provide the guidance, provide the recommendations that people need um, as they're interacting with the new UI. And they're getting into that. Okay, so. That's essentially at the heart of it. When you're, make, when you're creating insights and recommendations, you kind of have to think about that. So what are the things available to me? How can I improve that design? And what are the ways that I make those interactions uh, catered to the user um, desires and the user goals, right? So because every task is driven by a goal, how do I meet that goal so that the task then matches the user achieving that goal? So every Insight and recommendation that you put in your report as you're finishing this analysis, again, it's an analysis process, you're a researcher in that, uh, in that frame of mind, you would then give people, and by people I mean stakeholders, developers, whoever else is on the team, you would give them a recommendation for, this is how you could make that work for my specific subgroup, my specific demographic that I've looked at here um, within this specific cognitive task that I want people to achieve. Okay, and then, um, giving them action steps to get there. All right. Um, that pretty much sums it up. For today, if you want to know more about how to conduct a cognitive walkthrough and uh, how to do task analysis, here's some links. I'll post those slides for you online. And that's it for today's lecture. Now we've got the feedback frenzies. Please take a hot moment to complete those.
extra paper she needs an extra paper too can you return your paper then or are you you just don't have oh you didn't have one like 10 people maybe missing. Did that feel more difficult or easier than other lectures today? I just have a feeling today everyone was kind of like tuned out, but maybe that's reading week. Was it harder? You don't want to, nobody wants to admit it. Maybe more difficult. Newer? Yeah. 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 I was going to say, the word confidence feels like I feel like it comes up a lot, but I still don't know. Like, I have no So if you want a pencil. Let's try if that works. Oopsie. Well, this just gave up in between this tracking you for a while. Oh. Oh, I think if you just kind of... Maybe it just 